and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. We are packed today. Coming out of the frozen frenzy last night in the National Hockey League, all 32 teams in action, including the Winnipeg Jets, who had a big home win in regulation against a divisional opponent, the St. Louis Blues. We'll get to all of that. I'm looking forward to uh, going around the league a little bit with Craig Button of TSN, who will be jumping on with us and then really diving into the Winnipeg Jets as they hit the road to Detroit and Montreal for a quick two-game roadie Thursday and Saturday with Murata Tesh of The Athletic. And a little later on, coming off a 1,000-yard receiving season that was officially clinched for uh, the uh, player on Saturday, Nick Dembski's jumping on. We'll talk about the vibes around the Blue Bombers clinching the West again and now preparing for the West Final on November 11th. And, of course, we do have the Bomber nominees for the awards, which we've been talking quite a bit about. Very difficult decision between Zach Caleros and Brady Oliveira um, for MOP. We'll get to that coming up as well. So Dembski, Atesh, Craig Button, all lined up should be a great show, and it's great to have you all with us. Special shout out to the podcast listeners that are making us a part of your day. And welcome to everybody on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't already, make sure you've hit the subscribe and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel for Winnipeg Sports Talk. Just before we bring in Michael Remus, I've got to thank the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Our friends at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada. Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Little Brown Jug, Consolidated Supply, F Apparel, the Nick and Nikki DQ Group, Wallace and Wallace, Vita Health Fresh Market, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Aquatech, Modern Man, the Winnipeg Jets, and we will get to a why not question of the day for our friends at Not Auto Corp over at Waverly and McGillivray. Let's get Michael Rivas in here and uh, Remo. You were at the game last night up at how, how was the press box last night? I can tell you it was a. Uh, Fun night in the lower bowl. I uh, really enjoyed that one last night and a big win for the home team. Yeah, it was a great time up there. Sat next to Dave Maduk of uh, Legal Curve. Who's there? Ken, Marat, Mike. A lot of interest in the Jets game, but also interest in Game 7 of the NLCS and did not see Arizona uh, pulling that one off. So, I mean, the World Series that everyone thought it was going to be Texas, Arizona, a lot of... Well, I'm sure it'll have great ratings, but... Um, yeah, it was the Jets last night, 745 start, part of the frozen frenzy. And I tweeted, you know, it's, this is awesome, but, you know, the Red Zone style broadcast only available on ESPN in the States. I'm sure there's major disagreements in the rights holders in Canada. They can't seem to get along for the good of the fans. Uh, oh, oh, well. But hey, I know well, a lot of us. There's only one rights holder. Like, well, I, mean, I think me, regional, easy- I think region in the in the Canada. I'm saying Bell and I didn't want to name oh, Bell I see and Rogers. What you mean with the regional, I'm saying yeah. I'm sure like TSN's like, well, you can't air our feed if you're gonna air uh, this Frozen Frenzy broadcast. You know, we have the rights to air regionally Jets games or whatever. I'm sure there's some some crap. Nah, like, probably, I'm sure there's some crap like onto that. Something like that. I'm sure it's something like that. So we couldn't get it in Canada. But hey, I had a lot of people texting me or tweeting at me like, hey, here's some alternate ways. You can watch it. So people are going to find ways. It's up to the broad, the rights holders to, to figure it out. But, hey, 7.45 start. I loved it. Put the kids to bed. Got to the game in time for a pup drop us. with. Uh, oh. I think that's Marat's line, pup drop. So. Shout out to Duke. Yeah. I, I put this out. Uh, that's the best puck drop in the league. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's close. Having Duke from the Toba Center come out, uh, you know, it was great to see. I mean, we know the, the work that Adam Lowry's been doing in the community um, especially with the Toba Center, um, mm-hmm. and uh, brought out. They were all there in the uh, the nice heritage uh, Lowry jerseys. 
But yes, it was Duke, the puck dropping dog that absolutely stole the show <laughs> as he did last year. And uh, uh, that was a great moment. And um, listen, it was another small crowd. Uh, I, I know we kind of talked about that over the last week. I anticipate these weekday games early on in the season will be similar for the next little while. Um, but I'll say this, I mean, especially in uh, in the lower bowl, it was a little different when I, you know, we were all there uh, together last Tuesday at the Kings game. And, you know, part of it was the fact that, you know, the game didn't go the Jets way. They didn't score till there was a minute left in the game. And I think there was a little bit of shock at what the crowd was, uh, you know, upstairs. Um, I'll say though, fans were great. The ones that were there last night were really behind the Jets. I thought they got into the game and listen, they were treated to a very, very good performance overall by the Winnipeg Jets. Connor Hellebuck was great. He didn't have a ton of work, but when he did Remus, he was, uh, he was standing tall, a couple big breakaway saves, one on Jordan Cairo that I thought was really pivotal in the game. Um, and then what can you say about uh, the uh, the hard work of the guys lower down the lineup? Uh, the Gus Bus gets on the board, his first goal since, what, 2019? Mason Appleton as well. And then uh, Morgan Barron pops in an empty netter. Kyle Connor with a beautiful snipe. The Jets score four times and only give up a couple. And uh, as Connor Hellebuck said in that After Hours interview, um, you know, usually if the couple goes in, don't expect any more. And um, he has really, really rebounded from... You know, our first three games that weren't really up to his standard, and uh, he's been a big reason why the Jets have rattled off two in a row hitting the road. 100%. I th thought this was a complete effort from the Jets. Uh, I thought they outplayed the Blues. Maybe a couple mistakes there, allowing uh, the two breakaways, but Connor Hellebuck stood tall, and for the Jets, I mean, co contributions up and down the lineup. I thought Cole Perfetti, you know, had some beautiful passes uh, throughout the game, setting up David Gustafson for his first goal. What a dish I by Fetty. Yeah, and under four years, just under four years. And, I mean, he had a couple nice ones, nice uh, drop pass on his own entry uh, to Schmidt. I know he set up Nemestikov as well. Um, so he that was nice for him. And, you know, the Appleton-Lowry, sorry, Appleton-Lowry-Niederreiter line I thought was strong. Um, and Appleton, you know, going bang, bang there in the second period. Very similar goals as the Jets finding some soft area off to the side and putting it past Binner. And but hey, uh, you know the Blues. Credit to them, battled back, made it two one in the second. And you're like, hey, the Jets have outplayed the Blues, out shooting them quite a bit here in the second period. But the high danger chances were, you know, a bit closer than you would think. And you know the Blues start off the third period on the power play, but it got evened up shortly after. And Kyle Connor with the game winner, just a gorgeous shot over the shoulder of Jordan Bennington, and that was you know, that was the game winner for the Jets. And you know St. Louis got one at the end, but. Uh, wasn't wasn't enough. That was a weird one. Uh, the second goal for St. Louis, but I thought the Jets were the superior team throughout the night. You know they've played kind of the way they've played most of the games. You know limiting, hiding, limiting shots, uh, controlling play, and they've been getting the goaltending as well. Like you mentioned, Connor Hellebuck kind of going back to what we're used to seeing from him after the slow start. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, th this was a team effort, um, and, and I think, I, I listen. I, you know, when a team and uh, someone close, someone part of the family, if you will, goes through some adversity, everyone, I think, wants to stand up and and get behind that person. And I knew, you know, there was a real sense of, um, you know, this team, not only, I mean, listen, they're pros. I mean, you, you want to win at home. You want to win in front of your home fans. You want to get back to 500 for the season after dropping a couple that you probably thought you deserved earlier in the year. But it really did seem like a very, very focused hockey club last night shift after shift after shift to doing the right things um, they seemed very determined to get that win um, for bones who of course was home with his uh, wife judy who we understand is doing better which is wonderful news um, but this was as you mentioned a real team effort and man it was nice to see some of those guys especially gustafson get rewarded i mean i, I was talking yesterday about how impressed I, I thought i was of him in the game against the edmonton oilers um, and once again, we saw late in a very close game, the fourth line out, um, Scott Arneal, not afraid to play that fourth line. Um, but Gustafson is dead deserved. He's had some really tough luck, both with injuries and not being able to score. Um, and Cole Perfetti absolutely teed him up in the slot. He made no mistake about it. And, um, the Jets really just felt like they needed to get one and then things would get going. That's exactly what happened is Appleton scored on a similar goal and not even 30 seconds later. Yeah, exactly. And look, they had some, you know, the first period, uh, 
I had heard, you know, on the broadcast, and I was at the game, that Kevin Sawyer kept calling it low, low event, low event. Like, there was really not much going on. They did have a lot of pressure there near the end, that third line, but I, they kind of just passed it on the outside and didn't get any uh, of those dangerous chances, but they were able to find spots. Appleton and Nemestikov, you know, finding a little off to the side. They get open for a second, and it's in, and Mason Appleton did say after the game they kind of found that out from the pre-scout on video so full credit to the coaching staff and yeah i mean you get contributions from you know your bottom you know your bottom six uh you know bottom two lines bottom six forwards and your goalie plays uh lights out i didn't think he had to do a ton of work i mean he made 18 saves of 20 shots but he you know, made the big ones on those breakaways when he needed to uh one thing you know one thing the special team says jets went over three on the power play one for four and the Blues went one for four. So the Blues did win the special teams battle. And face-offs, I was very, you know, considering how much the Jets outplayed St. Louis, and St. Louis, we know they don't have Ryan O'Reilly anymore. Shocked to see the face-offs 65% to 35% uh, as per NHL.com. That is surprising because it seemed I, I like know. the Jets had the puck for uh, for most of it. I mean, just from being there, it didn't seem like it was, you know, heavily weighted one way or the other. I, um, and listen, the power play goal that they did score, I mean, that was an absolutely perfect play on the stick of, stick of Buknevich. Um, he, you know, deflected it in over the over the shoulder of Connor Hellebuck on one that he really didn't have a chance and uh, chance on. And listen, I thought Bennington played really well. Um, you know, there was the, the shots that the Jets had in the first period, I don't want to say were of really high quality. Um but they got some pucks on net. And, and if anything, you could just tell that Bennington was locked in. Um, and then, of course, they scored the two quickies uh, and got up 2 nothing. And, and you know, to his credit, he, he he hung in there and stayed in the game. A lot of times you'll see Bennington just sort of lose it when things go south for him. Um, but he hung in. But once again, um, you know, the first four games, we said that the Jets didn't have the best goaltender on the ice. For the last two games, they certainly have, have had... And um, Hellebuck was uh, was the better goaltender, and certainly the Jets were the better team last night. And, uh, you know, they did what they had to do. Coming out of that win against Edmonton, build off that momentum, Remus, and, you know, put a couple wins together, get back to 500, and now a big opportunity as they go on the road to take on a Red Wings team that lost in ridiculous fashion last night. And then, of course, the Montreal Canadiens, who... Um, took it on the chin from one of the top teams in the league, the New Jersey Devils, last night as part of the 16-game uh, slate. Yeah, Detroit, we weren't sure if they were going to be a playoff team this year. They've got off to a hot start with uh, Alex DeBrincat coming over in the trade and then signing. I mean, he's putting, what, he's got nine goals now in, a, in this, you know, what, first couple weeks of the season. Pretty incredible. And, yeah, I mean, Saturday was kind of like must-win, can't-lose territory for the Jets against Edmonton, mm. and it did not... Edmonton lost on Saturday and got embarrassed by uh, by Minnesota yesterday. So the Jets, you know, there may be, you know, after that L.A. game, you didn't look so great and you lost to Vegas, although they have, I think they've played pretty well in just about every game except for that uh, that L.A. game. Uh, and maybe, you know, you can argue the Edmonton game as well. Hellbuck stole it for them. But the Jets, they're now 3-3, three and three, and I'm looking at Dom's uh, projections here, and he's got the Jets 71 percent chance at the playoffs so i think they're they're in a pretty good spot here and heading on the road uh, detroit montreal i have a lot of you know montreal's not good but i have a lot of bad memories of the winnipeg jets in montreal and that's kind of well, where detroit yeah and they've had some stinkers in detroit too they ugly ugly games there so <laughs> that's i true. think they you know what hopefully those uh those bad memories can um, get them uh, even more prepared uh, shout out to waiters in chat, bumped into waiters at the end of the game. Nice to see you there. And I see Schickster, Schickster asking about the 16-game parlay. Well, I didn't do a 16-gamer. I did a 9-gamer. And eight of them were correct. And the one that killed it at 210 to 1 was the Detroit game. Um, and then, I, and I mean, I, I've been... I've been so bent all morning. I woke up to Aaron Ward's tweet that, you know, uh, showing the uh, Seattle player throwing the stick at one of the uh, wings late in the game that should have iced it for Detroit. That didn't happen. Seattle scored with a minute 22 left and then five seconds left in overtime 
to uh, to crush my dreams. We the ride with Huss though at Cool Bed did cash again, so um, things are going quite well. But that was a uh, that was a very very tough pill to uh, tough pill to swallow. Um, listen, Craig Button's coming up, and we'll talk more about the big big game last a uh, big game here in Winnipeg and the ones around the league. Uh, but let's get a little bit from uh, Coach Arneal. Of course, Scott Arneal taking Rick Bonus's spot as the interim head coach right now is. He's with his wife, Judy, who's recovering at home now. Um, Arnie talked about the defensive game of the Winnipeg Jets as he saw it last night. You know, as a whole, I thought, you know, we did a lot of real good things. Talked this morning about how good St. Louis is on the rush, and we saw that, especially that top line. Uh, they had five or six chances there through the first two periods. So kind of got that straightened away a little bit in the third and did a better job of kind of keeping people in front of us. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, we had talked, you know, we've always talked about, uh, you know, playing tight games, 2-1 games, finding ways to, uh, you know, to finish them off. And that's what we were going into the third period. And we did a great job of bringing it home. All right, so there's Scott O'Neill on, uh, you know, the overall thoughts of the game that the Jets played as well as their uh, defensive acumen last night. Um, uh, Arnie, listen, everyone, I think, felt good for David Gustafson. He got the jacket last night from uh, Josh Morrissey. Here was uh, the coach on uh, the Gus bus getting on the scoreboard. Yeah, it's great. Gus is such a, you know, hardworking kid and uh, real quiet and just goes about his work every day. And, you know, he had a really good training camp for us. Uh, started as our 13th forward and you would never know it just the way he approaches his uh, day-to-day work and it's great to see the guys love it when you know a guy like that goes out and scores a huge goal like he did tonight and as i mentioned off the top of the show i think gustafson since coming into the lineup after the velarde injury is you know probably playing as well and as comfortably as i think that he has at any point in his nhl career and this goal that he scored last night i think is only going to help to you know, boost that confidence um, because certainly in all the other aspects, he's been playing very responsibly. And that's, you know, something that, you know, he has always brought to the table. Uh, but it's always big when your fourth line can chip in and he did that. The Appleton goal was quite similar to the uh, um, to the Gus goal. Um, here's Arnie on uh, on Mason Appleton getting one shortly after Gus opened the scoring. Um, it's kind of a little bit how they play. You know, there there's some space there that we found and, um, if we stayed in the corners and tried to muck it that way, they get numbers in there and there's no lot, a lot of space. We did a good job of getting it away from the corners and that was rimming it out um, using the whole area. And then from there, it was a couple of quick passes and you catch them spread out and you find those uh, open areas. You know, uh, interesting comment there from, uh, from Arnie Reem. Um, in that, you know, they found some space in the offensive zone. Um, and, and I thought the Jets did a great job of utilizing their sticks and winning puck battles in the offensive zone to keep possession and to, uh, you know, maintain control of the puck. Didn't always turn into great scoring chances. Um, but I think we all know that the best defense is spending most of the time in the other team's end. And I thought the Jets did a real good job of that last night. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I thought they controlled play, you know, pass around the outside, waiting for their opportunities, and had a number of chances. Bennington uh, was pretty good when he needed to be, but I mean, those are some bang-bang plays with shots off to the side, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, directly in front of the crease, but if you're, you know, a little off to the side, you can get him moving, like a perfetti pass from uh, behind the net, right on the tape, and, you know, all I have to do is interesting hearing Gustafson saying hey, he's such a good, good passer, you know, just have your stick on the ice and be ready, because... Um, I thought Perfetti made some great passes. He did get knocked over in the first period by Justin Falk. Uh, pretty e- easily pushed him over, but hey, he got back up and uh, made a, f- a few beauty plays, Perfetti. Well, and and, uh, and played, you know, through the third period. Um, I, I, listen, there's been a lot of talk about Cole playing at center, playing on the wing, how important he is playing in that role right now. And of course, seeing um, quite a bit of the pine in the second half of the third period and overtime on, on uh, against the Oilers on Saturday. Great response from Perfetti last night. And he, of course, was, uh, you know, was it the trigger man or the, uh, the key guy that set up the trigger man, David Gustafson, on that beautiful play um, to get the team on the board. Here's one more from Arnie, of course. Uh, Rick Bonus and his wife Judy and everybody's thoughts last night. And um, Arnie talked about playing for uh, the bonuses. Well, they they've, they talked about about you know making sure that they go out and not let him down and you know they wanted to do it for all the right reasons and 
you know, like we said, we're a family here and we care about each other and, you know, they care about uh, Rick and Judy and they, they wanted to put our, their best foot forward and I thought they did a great job of it. Said this morning, a big divisional opponent and, you know, it's our first one of the year and it's a big one. All right, so there's uh, there's Scott Arneal and uh, we'll go to seven right now, Reem. Uh, Mason Appleton also chimed in afterwards um, that, the uh, you know Rick and Judy Bone is definitely in uh, his thoughts and uh, the entire team last night. Here's Mason Appleton on uh, their absent coach and his wife and uh, what they wanted to do for him last night. You know this game certainly is dedicated to them. Uh, Bones knows that um, we're all here for him and we're all here for Judy as well. And you know we're happy that she's you know doing better. And uh, uh, obviously there's a bit of a recovery and. But he, Bones also knows that we're going to do our job here and, you know, we're going to play as hard as we can for, uh, for him and her and we're going to keep this thing going and whenever the time's hopefully right for Bones to be back and Judy to be 100% healthy, then, uh, then that day will come. But uh, right now we're just, you know, praying for him, thinking for him or thinking of him and, uh, yeah, we still, we still have a job to do. So it's, it's tough. It's, it's how the world works sometimes. But, uh, yeah, you know, you could call this win for her for sure. All right, so there's Mason Appleton, who uh, was he and he and Gus that got the jackets last night. Gus got the leather for, I believe, the player of the game. Mason Appleton for the unsung hero, but um, you know both the third line, the fourth line, big big parts of the of the win last night for the Winnipeg Jets. Connor Hellebuck with a really strong game, and Kyle Connor doing Kyle Connor things with that beautiful snipe to get the Jets back up two goals in that third period and I think give a bit more of a comfort level even after the St. Louis Blues tied it up with an empty net again uh, early with about three minutes left. Um, let's hear from David Gustafson. We haven't heard a lot from Gus this year, but um, he was one of the stars of the show last night and had a big smile on his face meeting the media post game. Uh, it's been a long way, but uh, you know, it's fine. I'm happy it's finally happened, and uh, you know it's a big weight lift on my shoulders. So I hope I can keep this going. Seems like you have a little bit more of a shooter's mentality. Is that something that you focused on coming into camp? As well? Yeah, I mean, if you want to score a goal, you got to shoot. So that's been my first mindset, and you know I think I had some good looks today, and one of them finding back on the net. David, I'm guessing the, your teammates awarded you one of the jackets there. It seemed like probably your goal would have been very popular, considering that you do a lot of the little things in the game there. To like Ken said be rewarded with the red lights yeah i mean uh, yeah i got one on a jacket and uh, you know i'm happy jmo gave it to me and uh, you know it's nice to get that recognition what about the pass from Paul? oh it's a it's a really nice pass i mean uh, he's been uh, i you know if it's a skilled player you can make those passes so whenever you're on the ice with him just have your stick down and you can get just get a good scoring chance like i got did you just come off the bench what did you see on that uh, on that play on your way in yeah, I mean, uh, Fly made a great change there, and I just came in and I saw a spot open in the slot, so I just try to get there as quick as I can, and, you know, Fetz put it right on my tape. All right, so uh, there's the Gus bus. Everyone happy for David Gustafson last night. How was Ken in the uh, press box last night? Was uh, was Ken uh, oh. doing a bit of a uh, victory lap uh, <laughs> around, 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 look, the, around the press box look, after the goal? I know there's no <laughs> cheering in the press box, but I think Ken, the number one driver... Of the Gus bus, well, aside from Gustafson, but yeah, big big smile for Ken. You heard him getting those questions in there, so you know, nice to see him get rewarded. As we said, you know, injuries, you know, his first goal in just under four years, but he hasn't really played a lot of NHL games. He scored in preseason, he scored with the Moose, but you know, under four years, uh, November 2017 was the last goal, or sorry, 2019. 2019. Yeah. You know, I I can't believe it's 2023. So I still think it's, <laughs> I. You know, I'm shocked at every time. So, yeah, in 2019. Uh, Phyllis said, Ken was one proud papa on KNR. Hey, uh, listen, Gustafson is doing everything that's being asked of right now. And, and I'll let me say this. I, I think the way that he's playing is going to, um, you know, if Gabriel Velarde comes back and this team is fortunate enough to be healthy with the current 13 forwards they have, um, Gustafson, the way he's playing right now, is going to make it tough to take him out of the lineup. And that's the sort of internal competition you want with the team that is much deeper than it's been in a number of years. One other thing that came out of last night, and again, um, if you were at the game, you probably didn't see this. 
Um, but it was on insider trading, I believe, with the uh, with the TSN guys. Darren Drager was in Winnipeg and did sit down with Mark Chipman. I believe this interview is going to be broadcast during tomorrow's Detroit game, uh, Detroit broadcast um, on TSN. Um, and obviously, there's been plenty of questions about where the organization's at right now um, with some of the smaller crowds that they've seen, certainly com in comparison to previous seasons. Um, this is a, a clip that TSN released of Mark Chipman in conversation with Darren Drager in the full interview will uh, be dropping tomorrow. Is there any real threat of a sale, a relocation, if this can't get turned around? No, I, I can see how somebody might, how you could ask that question, you know, because it, because it happened once, is there concern that could happen again because you're a small snuffle? I say, um, you know, like not on our watch. Um, we've been doing this far too long. We got in into this for the very reason of that heartbreak that you described. It was that very emotion that brought us into this and then that kept us um, in the fight to, to get a building built and then to, to, to acquire a team again. So, you know, and then to have 10 years of sellouts and have two years of, of challenge brought on by a global pandemic, um, It'd be a little extreme, you know, for us to say, oh, gee, I, we're not sure this works anymore. All right. So there's uh, the comments from Mark Chipman. We'll be interested to hear uh, that entire interview tomorrow with Dr Darren Dreger. And, you know, as I said, we've been working on it at, at some point. Would love to uh, would love to speak with Mark on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk about, um, you know, moving forward and trying to, uh, you know, see what the plans are to try to change the trend right now, the concerning trend to many fans. Um, the fact that we've been missing a bunch of the fans that have been regulars there for a long, long time down at Canada Life Center. Um, Craig Button is coming up in just a minute. So uh, while we get ready for Craig, let me uh, give a big shout out to uh, everyone, all the fellas that have already jumped on and joined our WST Movember team. Uh, if you're thinking about jumping on board, promoting men's health, Great cause. We're teaming up with Modern Man and putting together a WST Movember team. So, fellas, uh, podcast listeners, especially if you, if you haven't caught this before, if you're uh, willing to grow a stash for the month and be part of it, we'll probably get a few incentives from our friends at Modern Man for some of the guys on the team. Uh, we'll follow your progress throughout the month, and uh, we'll do our best along with everybody in chat to uh, raise some money for a great cause. Let us know. Send us an email, winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. If you want to grow a stash for Movember and join the Winnipeg Sports Talk Movember team. Of course, Modern Men Barbershops now have eight locations in Winnipeg. Uh, you can get that stash and uh, you can get fully clean shaven for Movember and then get ready to go and grow it for the entire month. Uh, they've got uh, haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. You can book your look via modernmanbarber.com. And uh, again, winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com if you want to join the WST team. Uh, shout out to Aquatech. Of course, they're the pool experts. If you're thinking about taking the plunge in 2024, talk to them about designing, financing options. What you might not know is that whole home renovations start with Aquatech as well. With thousands of rentals as their foundation, Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, your bathroom, or even add a man cave to your home, visit aqua-tech.ca to learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. Well, coming out of the game last night, we saw those first few snowflakes of the year. Yikes. Uh, we do know winter is around the corner. Are you ready for it? You better pop down and see our friends at Manitoba Battery if you're not, because, of course, they've got free battery testing to let you know where your car or truck battery is. Um, but you don't want to be on the side of the road calling a friend for a boost or a new battery. You need to get ahead of that. And that, of course, is at Manitoba Battery. Shopping local, getting the best prices in town, bar none, and beating the pants off the big box stores. And with the best service in town as well, as Donnie and the gang will deliver that battery to you anywhere in the city of Winnipeg for free with any purchase over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. Head on over to manitobabattery.com. You can give them a call at 783-8787 and always pop by and see them in person 
at 1026 Logan Avenue. Just before we bring in Craig Button, big shout out to our friends at Canadian Club. Of course, the CC will be flowing November 11th at IG Field as the Bombers look to book another ticket to the Grey Cup. But right now for you whiskey lovers, the Canadian Club Invitation Series 15-year-old Sherry Creek has just launched. It's $79.99, a limited one-time release. There will be other Invitation Series varieties released annually over the next few years. This is this year's one. So uh, get on over to your local Manitoba Liquor Marts right now for that limited one-time release of the 15-year-old Sherry Cask CC Invitation Series. All right. What a great day to have Craig Button on coming out of a night with every NHL team in action. TSN's Director of Scouting joins us now. Craig, what's up? It's great to have you back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to join you. A couple of things I want to say. We got about 25 centimeters of snow in Calgary. Whoa. And uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. So like you can talk about those little flurries in Winnipeg. <laughs> Listen, we got we 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 got the full meal deal here in Calgary. It's about minus 19 with the wind chill today here in Calgary. And guess what? And it's a reminder to all your listeners and all your viewers. Like, take care of winter before winter comes to you because I still need my winter tires on my car. And, uh, you know, I'm backed up a little bit. So that's where it's at. Second thing I got to say is, you know, go Bombers. Uh, you know, the Stamps got into the playoffs. Luckily, because the Rough Riders uh, just uh, spit the bit down the stretch again for the second year in a row. But the Bombers, I think they're going to turn the tables this year and, and win the Great Cup for the third time in four years. So, uh, they look like the best team. I know the Argos are good, but uh, I think there's a little redemption here for the Bombers. Yeah, love the support for the blue and gold right out of the gate, Craig. Yeah, people are really <laughs> excited. I mean, it's been a magical season here on the field, mm-hmm. in the stands, and two more wins to uh, finish the job for a team that has really established a, a true championship culture here in Winnipeg. Um, hey, I'll, I'll ask you about the Jets game last night and everything else, but first off, for someone that you know, studies and covers the National Hockey League. How did you enjoy the 16-game slate last night, staggered throat, and how did you consume it, Craig? You know, I, you know, for about 10 years or so, I did the NHL Network, and we used to do the on-the-fly. We used to whip around the league and do exactly that. Kevin Weeks, you know, was on it with ESPN along with John Butchergrass. So, you know, Kevin is uh, very well versed in uh, moving around. And obviously you start uh, early and and the first game you're kind of waiting. Then you're trying to hopeful that that provides a little bit. Then second game, by the time you get into the meat of the schedule and you got six games under your belt, you're going to be able to draw on a lot of stuff. But for me, the way I look at it is, you know, fans are going to watch what they – they're going to watch their team. You know, the Winnipeg Jets fans were tuned in to their Jets team. And, you know, if you're a St. Louis Blues fan, you're tuning in to the St. Louis Blues. And I, I think one of the things – and I, I mean, the idea is one that I, I get it, but one of the things that drives the NFL red zone is fantasy. There's no real fantasy in hockey. And so everybody wants to know how their fantasy player is doing, who got a, who got a 10 yard run, who got a 17 yard catch, who got an interception. And they go, hockey doesn't draw that overall hockey fan because of, because there's no fantasy, but, it, but because hockey really is a, 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 a specific team, you know, fan base. Yeah, I know there's some general fans and certainly you whip around the league and it's nice. It kind of gives you a little bit of a, kind of gives you a little bit of a, of a view of what's going on in different parts. But, hey, you know what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I think NHL fantasy is growing. And certainly we're cranking out DraftKings contests with everyone in the chat on the, uh, the show every day. And listen, with the proliferation of uh, legalized gambling um, on both sides of the border, I think that this is something that we'll see more of in the future. And I know there's a mm-hmm. lot of talk about, oh, you're doing it on NBA opening night and there's the game seven. I mean, this was a test that I think they did early on in the year from everything that we've seen on social media. It was very well received. And I would imagine the plan, Craig, is that, you know, in future seasons, this would be a perfect Super Saturday setup once ESPN is done with their college football slate and the National Football League playoffs. I have a feeling this is something we probably see later on in the season to really try and dominate a day like Saturday that traditionally has a lot of games on. 
Yeah, wouldn't it be great, like, once the Super Bowl is played, that, like, all that stretch of time before Major League Baseball starts and NHL playoffs start, that would be the time to run it. Like, just because now you have the audience to yourself and and you have the uh, the, the airwaves. I know the NBA is still playing and very uh, uh, very strong following, but th- th- that's when I would really look at uh, trying to take advantage of this idea. Um, let's start off with the home team here. A, a nice, a tidy win over the St. Louis Blues last night. Connor Hellebuck, you know, I, I was in Edmonton for the game on Saturday, Craig. And listen, Helly, you know, his first week was not up to the incredible standard that he's set. They were down 2 nothing early, and it seemed like it was maybe going to be a long night for me with my Oiler pals in the stands. Uh, and then he just reverted to the guy that we have seen for so long. I mean, it wasn't as busy last night, but certainly made some big saves. Um, in a lot of ways, the Jets go as Connor Hellebuck goes, and uh, we've really seen him step up in these last two wins for Winnipeg. No question about it. And and, and uh, nobody's surprised. I think we're more surprised when Connor's a little bit off his game, not when mm-hmm. he's on it, because when he's on it, I mean, he's one of the very best goaltenders in the entire National Hockey League. I don't think anybody would question that. And, you know, you, a, a team tries to find its footing. You're trying to find it, your, your footing in all the different areas of the game. And the first period versus St. Louis on Tuesday night was interesting. You know, I, I, I thought that the Jets were in a, were in a situation where they gave up uh, some uh, good scoring chances, but Hellebuck was, was terrific, as you point. But then the second period began. And, and they really took control of that game. They scored those two goals, and they were going for the juggler. They were, and I love that about the Jets. Go, like they were gonna, they wanted to get the St. Louis Blues out of any thought that they could get back in the game, and and maybe that became part of their mindset because of what happened in Edmonton on Saturday night. Edmonton's up two nothing. You know they were able to stay in the game. Couple, but but then you you, you think about a team that has no foothold in the game, and that was the St. Louis Blues. Nate Schmidt makes a terrible play at the offensive blue line, breakaway by Kyrou. And then right shortly thereafter, Dylan DeMello doesn't make a very strong play, breakaway by Kyrou. And who saves the bacon? <laughs> it's Mr. Connor Hellebuck. And, and you need that. And a goaltender will tell you, hey, that's my job. I got to do it. But those are the types of – when you have such control of a game, keep control of the game. Don't give up that part of the game. And that's part of, you know, developing your group, developing your team, developing your players to understand where it's at. I made a comment during the uh, intermission, after the second intermission, you know, you hear coaches, and Rick Bonus is no different, manage the puck, manage the game. And when you're making those plays like Nate Schmidt and Dylan DeMello made, that's not managing the puck, it's not managing the game. And the saving grace, pun intended, was Connor Hellebuck. You know, um, you know those two plays, as you mentioned, they got bailed out by Hellebuck. That didn't as much happen in those first three games. But I, I mean, just your perspective on the Jet Blue Line overall. Josh Morrissey continues to build off that incredible season he had last he had last year. We've seen Nate Schmidt be a healthy scratch, come back in, had a stronger game against the Oilers on Saturday. Um, but what do you make of the Jet Blue Line? And if, if you were looking at a spot to improve the club, is that where you're looking at, Craig? One hundred percent. I'm not looking anywhere else. That is, and, and there's always desires. Okay, could we be a little stronger here? Could we find a little bit more strength there? Yeah. Listen, you have Josh Morrissey. He's a clear-cut number one elite defenseman. He's a stud. After that, it falls off pretty considerably. It really does. You know, you, what what Josh Morrissey needs is along the lines of what Ottawa did in trading for Jacob Chikrin. It, it, it takes some of the pressure off of uh, Thomas Shabbat, who was asked to do everything, and then more, playing upwards of 30 minutes a night. Then, then they, they end up drafting Jake Sanderson fifth overall, and he's really emerged. To me, the, the Winnipeg Jets, at best, at best, after Josh Morrissey, they have a number four defenseman. And I don't think they have a, a steady number four. I think if you got a really good number three, Brendan Dillon could support that in some ways. You know, maybe Neil Pionk, you know. But you, you can have a collection of five, six defensemen for the most part and a number one. And when you get up against the hard competition, there's too many of the defensemen that get overextended. And I think that's where Kevin Shovel Day off and the management team has to look really hard in improving this team. They get a you're not listen you're not getting a number one defenseman but you get a really good 
number three, a really good number two, whatever it may be, this team becomes measurably better just by that type of an addition. Well, and, and, you know, and we've talked a lot about the blue line for the last couple of years, and it is relatively, basically similar. We thought Billy Hanel was going to crack the lineup, and, of course, he had that unfortunate injury. Um, so I imagine he'll be in the lineup at some point. Um, but your point is well taken. That being said, Craig, this team's quite different. Uh, you know, there's always the talk, oh, the Jets just keep running it back. Five of their 12 forwards weren't on the Winnipeg Jets. <laughs> On March 1st. Now, of course, Gabriel Velarde is out of the lineup due to the uh, unfortunate injury that he's had. But um, when you look at this club, um, I mean, I think you can certainly make the argument that they're much deeper. But how would you compare the forward group of the Winnipeg Jets six games into this season as opposed to what you've seen for the last couple? Yeah, well, you, you know, let's keep Velarde into the mix. I know he's out. I know he's going to be out for four to six weeks. But let, let, let's talk about what he what he brings to the team. And, you know, I, I, Adam Lowry talked about it at the outset. He, he talked about, listen, the three players we acquired may not be individually as good as Pierre-Luc Dubois, but the three of them make our team better. That's exactly what the goal always is. It's to make your team better. It's not – It l- listen, if it's always just about just getting good players – and, and everybody wants good players, but you need balance in your lineup. Velarde, Kupar, uh, Kupari, and IFL, they're big. They can skate. They can wear down a point. Ask any defenseman in the league, what's the hard, one of the hardest things to do? It's defending against big, fast, strong guys, spending time in your own zone. So now when you watch those, those players, those three additions, now you can spend more time in the offensive zone. You can grind along the board. You can wear out the other defensemen, which also takes pressure off your own defensemen. So in that trade, I think that Kevin made his team stronger. I think he made it deeper. I think he made it better. And, you know, it takes some of the pressure off of the blue line, which we just talked about. And now he can focus in on trying to find a player that can fit into that group and really help it along, which will, will, which will strengthen the team again. But so to me, that's where you want. I mean, Adam Lowry's a fantastic uh, number three center who can do so much for your team. Mark Shifley has been playing great. I, there, there's no area of the game where Mark – they have enough skill. But the size, the power, the speed – that's going to help you be a good team. You watched it closely last year in the playoffs. And the Vegas Golden Knights, they made trades for Mark Stone and for Jack Eichel, two, two really top-notch players, and then they signed Petrangelo. But the strength of their team is the depth, the balance. William Carrier, Nicolas Waugh, Keegan Colasar, uh, you know, Jonathan Marshall, so who they got. They traded Riley Smith, but they bring in Barbashev. So – when you, when you strengthen your team and you have balance in your team, that makes your team better. I think the Jets are a better team. I think they're better capable for the grind and to put pressure on opponents, take some of the pressure off your own blue liners, and now give Kevin some opportunity to improve in some other areas. Because there's a lot of really good prospects in, in, in uh, Winnipeg, but just like the Vegas Golden Knights, Kelly McCrimmon, that's all. They went and looked and said, wait, wait a second, we're going to have to give up some good players to get good players. But when you have good prospects, you can go and do that. That's exactly what they did. And I think that I think mm-hmm. Kevin and the Jets are going to have a, a similar opportunity. Uh, Craig, I've got to ask you about Mark Shifley. You just mentioned him and uh, the great start that he's had this season. And listen, he's been here for a long time. The last two seasons were not smooth. He had 42 goals last year. Um, but when you look at the end of the season, it wasn't even playing center. I mean, it seemed to be rocky, and there were major questions as to whether he would be back. Myself and I think a lot of people thought that, you know, that might be it for him as a Winnipeg Jet. Amazingly, things changed quite quickly in and around training camp. He and Connor Hellebuck signed those two massive extensions, identical deals. Just a quick thought on that, and Mark Shifley seemingly, in my opinion, kind of turning the page and starting a new chapter and looking as engaged and as good as maybe we've seen him. I, you know, I, I can't argue with anything you just said there. And, and looking as good and as engaged as we've ever seen him. So prior to the to, to last year and then the year before, and, and, and you know, I, I'll share this with you. You know, I, I, I Mark got suspended uh, for that hit on Jake Evans in, in, the, in, the, in the bubble playoffs, you know, back in 21. And, and I, 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 you know, I, I was very critical of, of the play in terms of it being deserving. 
anyway, I, I ended up running into Mark in Calgary during the summer. And, and, you know, one of the things that he, that he talked about was not realizing how hard and people not realizing how hard it was to be in that bubble, all the restrictions, you know, you, you, you were kind of with the team, but not with the team. You weren't really traveling. You couldn't go out, you know, all those things that weigh on, 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 in, it weighed on individuals in, around the world. And now you have players that, you know, are, you know, they can't see their family. Pierre-Luc Dubois told me, he said, I couldn't visit my mom and dad. I was in the same city because of COVID and everything. So I think there was some impact there. And then you come out of that and, you know, you, 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 you come back into kind of a normalcy that what was normal, maybe not as normal. And you're struggling to find that rhythm there's questions about you. The team isn't performing. It had missed the playoffs. And I, I think that Kevin, you know, made some he, – he, he put belief in the team prior to the last season. And then the team showed some good signs. But, you know, to Rick Bonus's comments, when, when push came to shove, you know, they, they got pushed back. And I think that Kevin really went and spent some time evaluating his group – talking with his individual players, specifically Hellebuck and Shifley, and said, hey, here's where we're at. Here's what I can do. Here's what you can do. And, you know, it's the only organization that Connor and Mark have known. And we know that the organization is a strong one. It's a good one. They take care of their people. They care about their people. And I think that Mark and Connor probably needed some reassurances. I mean, a contract extension certainly helps it. But they were going to have options outside of Winnipeg. I think Kevin Shevel Dayoff deserves a tremendous amount of credit in terms of saying to the players, we got you. We we want you. We got you. And we're going to make this team someplace that can be uh, a, a place where you feel you can have a chance to win. And 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 that's that's what management's role is. And I and and you gotta you're selling to the players, but I think that that's what Kevin was able to do uh, upon reflection. People can argue if he did it quick enough. People can argue if he shouldn't have made more changes. But when you look at everything that the Winnipeg Jets have done and the homegrown talent that they've done, I mean, I'll argue that uh, they're the best. They're, nobody's better than them in scouting and development. And now you can, with key players at key positions, play into their level of capability. Hmm. And I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity here for, for further growth and for the team to take steps forward in their in, in their play and become a become a contending team, I, now, I do believe that. And, and, and I mean, uh, the dual nature of the signings too, I think, were significant in a number of ways. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it 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 sends a message, or at least maybe helps curb the narrative that everyone's just dying to get out of Winnipeg, and you know, which is not true. I mean, history has told us that it's not the case, but when you have a Dubois situation that goes on along, that can kind of take on a, a, a you know a a life of its own. But I, I, I'm interested in Craig, especially with like three new players coming in from LA that are in a brand new spot. But one of the first things to happen is your two star players re upping and committing for another seven years. It's a great message to the guys inside that room about the direction of the team as well. And, and, and there you go direction of the team. So who sets the direction of the team? Mark Chipman and, and Kevin Sheveldale. They set the direction for the team. And Players and, and, and everybody involved have to have to believe that this is a direction that they want to jump on board with and go in. You know, you don't want to you don't want a backseat driver saying, hey, 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 you should turn left there. Oh, wait a sec. You should turn right there. Take this exit. You, you need to be committed to going in the direction that you're going into. And I think that, you know, when Connor said in his press conference, he goes, there's nobody I'd like to be more tied to. Then Mark Shifley, when I signed Mark, that to me was really telling because over the course of time, we, we you hear, you know, narratives, you hear talk and everything and talk can be cheap about, you know, other players and what they were feeling. When Connor said that, I said, this is a, this is a real positive sign. And, and you're right, the direction they're going into. So that sends a, a real strong to Josh Morrissey and to Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers and other players that are young. And, and you're also setting the, the, the standard and the template for the next group of young players coming through. And trust me, there's a lot of good young players. You do know right now 
who's one of the best players in the entire NCAA hockey, right? You do know this, don't I'm not, our, our guy I, I, I never ask you a question assuming you don't know the hey. answer because I know you know the answer. Listen, Rutger McGrory gets brought up in the chat every day and uh, he's having a monster season right now and great start for <laughs> Brad Lambert and Chibrikov and Lucius with the Manitoba Moose. Yep. Um, so there is some exciting things. Hey, Craig, I know you just got a couple minutes before you got to run. And thanks again for doing this. Um, you got the Heritage Classic coming up this weekend in Alberta. I just finished a show with Dustin Nielsen. Uh, Edmonton may as well be burning down right now with that game last night and obviously what the Jets did on Saturday. Um, just a quick thought on the Flames and the Oilers and where they are at respectively going into the weekend in the outdoor game? I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned about the ice conditions uh, with those two teams uh, hitting the ice on Sunday because they're both tire fires. <laughs> like they're dumpster fires right now, both those teams. <laughs> I don't, melt it. I don't <laughs> Well, I mean, I, listen, you know, you Zadorov came out uh, on Tuesday prior to the uh, uh, Flames uh, Rangers game and he laid it on the line. And you know if he, well, he he's right, and and the Oilers, I mean they're they're not very good. I mean they were they were the darlings of people picking them to be Stanley Cup champions this year. I was never buying. What changed from last year when they got dispatched by the Vegas Golden Knights to this year? They signed Connor Brown. They don't have depth in their forward group. Their defense isn't very good. Their defensive play isn't very good. And there's questions about the goaltending. I, I will only say this. If you think I'm buying that as a Stanley Cup contender, never happening. <laughs> and the Calgary Flames, guess what? As Zadorov said, you don't like hard coaching. You don't like soft coaching. You don't like nice coaching. What kind of coaching do you guys want? Doug Conroy, as the new GM, is getting an upfront and close view of, of his team. And he's going to have to evaluate what he does going forward here. Because, uh, you know, we can talk about capabilities of the team. Maybe this is all they're capable of. Craig, always great having you on the program. Uh, keep up the wonderful work over at TSN. We love when we see you on the Jets broadcast, and uh, let's do this again soon. Have a great day. Always, yep. You can always call that. Love joining you. <laughs> that was a great segment. There's the man himself, Craig Button, TSN's director of scouting. And uh, when we're lucky, part of the Jets on TSN broadcast team. Uh, we're going to stay on the Jets and some more pucks. Coming up with Barada Tesh. Um, but a little later on, Brady, uh, we'll talk about Brady Oliveira's MOP nomination for the Bombers, as well as the Outstanding Canadian. And uh, another guy that in any other year would have been the Outstanding Canadian for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Nick Dembski is going to join us coming up and uh, lo really looking forward to that. Just before, though, we bring in Murata Tesh from The Athletic. Uh, let me give a big shout out to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. If you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, you need to get on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. Don't forget, folks, you can order online, fully shoppable website with same day local delivery if you order by 11 a.m. And right now, get a free gift when you place an order for $100 or more at myvita.ca. Vita Health, a great local company, family owned and operated since 1936 right here in Winnipeg. And don't forget, they've got Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products too. Vita Health, empowering people to lead healthy lives, six Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. .ca. Uh, Wallace and Wallace, we all know, is the fencing experts in town. We've seen their fences and trucks all over the city. What you might not know is they're also the leaders in overhead garage doors as the Clopay dealer here in Manitoba. And listen, that overhead garage door had lots of ups and downs this summer. Working hard to get you and your family to all that summer fun, but it's about to work a whole lot harder because winter puts much more stress on a garage door. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now... Call Wallace and Wallace to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and Wallace. And hey, shout out to the gang over at F Apparel. Um, guys, if you're looking in that closet, realize the holidays are coming around and you need to up your menswear game, don't wait. Get on down to F Apparel at 190 Smith Street. Heading into winter, custom suits beginning at $400 along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. 
thinking about, uh, well, listen, if you're getting married or in a wedding party, make sure to talk to them as well about a 15% discount for wedding parties. Um, it's all there at 190 Smith Street. Make an appointment or find out more online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. And of course, the Jets on the road for the next couple of games, but we'll be back on Monday. It's going to be a big game and a fun one. Um, first of all, it is the return of Blake Wheeler. Um, you know, I know Wheeler was, uh, you know, a player that you know, different folks had different opinions on, but now that he's gone, I think that'll be a special night to, you know, to celebrate, you know, the incredible contributions he had to this team from 2011. Uh, it's also going to be the Halloween game. So with uh, Halloween the next day, get your tickets, get your costumes ready and uh, get ready to get down to the rink on October 30th for the Rangers loan visit of the year and Blake Wheeler back in Canada Life Centre for the first time as a visitor. All right, let's get Marat Atesh in here to get things going. Marat, what's up? How are you? Hey, life is good. How are you doing, us? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I mean, I, listen, I uh, I lost a 210 to 1 parlay on the ro- wings getting robbed last night. Um, you know, no, and normally I don't do those crazy things, but, you know, it was 16 games, so we were talking about all these games, picked nine Got the other eight right, and uh, I don't know whether I'll get over that one for a long, long time. That being said, it was a pretty fun night to uh, make a bet, to put a DraftKings lineup, or just to try and follow everything around the league. Um, I know we were at the rank, and we were focusing in on the Jets game, which we'll kind of dive into more in a sec. But what did you think of um, you know this first fr- uh, frozen frenzy, they called it, staggering the games and having every team in the league in action on the same night? You know, I honestly didn't get a chance to enjoy it like a proper fan would have. Yeah. Like, I think that the dream is you're kicking back on the couch. You got your feet up. You got all sorts of games on. One hits intermission. You move on to the next one. And I'm sure that that was great. But the honest truth is, no, I was just uh, working on stuff on my own and then getting ready for the for the Jets game. Um, so I hope fans uh, I hope fans had a good time of it. I, I just can't say I know a thing about how it felt on the other end. Yeah, I, I'm just interesting to see how it goes from here. I mean, I know Remus was tweeting about it. I mean, everyone's timelines for people that were lucky enough to be south of the border hockey fans that got a chance to see the frenzy and kind of a red zone style product that ESPN together um, got a lot of credit. And as I just mentioned with Button, I mean, to me, this I think was a was a dry run. And maybe they do it earlier on in the season as well. But those Saturdays are, you know, once college football no longer dominates ESPN, and you get through the football season, I think there's real potential for this because um, the early results were good. Of course, we were focused in on one game and one game only. That was the Jets and the Blues. Um, No Rick bonus. I thought the team really stepped up and played a solid 60 minutes um, for their coach, for Judy, for Scott O'Neill as well. Um, How did you see the uh, 60-minute pretty workmanlike win for the Winnipeg Jets? Another strong game for Connor Hellebuck, although not as busy as he'd been in some previous games. You know, it was a it was a hard working night for the Winnipeg Jets, and they got the results, and they looked like quality. And when they scored goals, they were really exploiting holes in the St. Louis Blues defense. You know, you heard that Mason Appleton quote because you saw on his goal, on David Gustafson's goal, and on a whole bunch of second period chances, Winnipeg was rolling out of the corner. Uh, the Blues had two defensemen and a center committed either behind the net or goal front. And there was soft ice in the middle of the circles around those face-off dots. And Winnipeg identified it in the pre-scout, credit to coaching on that front. And then they executed time after time throughout the second period, roll out of the corner, find somebody down low, roll out of the corner and uh, and find somebody down low. So credit to the Winnipeg Jets for for that win. And they deserve, they deserve praise for it. I also got to say, Connor Hellebuck, despite, uh, despite, I guess technically less uh, less workload than some of his recent efforts. He did have to work, and I thought Winnipeg was a bit fortunate early. One of the very first plays of the game, uh, Winnipeg sort of got his forecheck wrong. Kyle Connor doubled up on on Mark Shifley's guy. He gets beat by a pass. Josh Morrissey steps up. He gets beat, and all of a sudden it's a two on one that turns into a really dangerous chance for the Blues. Hellebuck goes across, gets a leg on it. It almost bounces in anyways, but it's a great save. 
And it was a night where those types of mistakes were made. There was a Blues transition offense to be had, but Hellebuck held the fort and it allowed Winnipeg to get into a rhythm, get into a groove and start exploiting those weaknesses on defense. You know, and just on Helly for a minute, um, you know, we were talking about it. I, of course, was in the building in uh, in Edmonton. And, uh, I mean, the start of the game on Saturday night was was a disaster. Um, you know, Appleton loses Nurse. Boom, it's one nothing. They get a power play. That's behind them. Uh, and I was really wondering at the time, going, oh, my God, how is this after hours interview going? And we know how intense Hellebuck is. And um, But, I mean, from there on out, he uh, he shut the door. Um I think it's safe to say that the first three games that he played weren't up to the incredible standard that he's set over a number of years. Um, and it's funny what happens when uh, 37 gets kind of back into his zone, what that does for uh, the wins and losses. 100%. I mean, the Connor Hellebuck formula is Winnipeg gives up a disproportionate amount of scoring chances. He steals goals away. Winnipeg does better in the standings than the scoring chances numbers say that they should. And Winnipeg's defending took a step forward last year. That was a positive sign. And there's lots of things to like. But, you know, when Connor Hellebuck gives up as many goals as he did early on in this season, and then on that second goal against Edmonton, he's, you know, pushing, he's trying to track, and I haven't had the chance to talk to him about this yet, but something in his push back into position on that power play goal uh, really let him down. He ended up so far out of the net as that goal goes in. And you're wondering, like, oh, okay, well, well, how bad is this? How bad is this going to get? And I even, uh, I think it was Dom at The Athletic, somebody at The Athletic wrote this. They were able to look at goals saved above expectation. And this is something that Connor Hellebuck has excelled at for year after year after year. He just stops pucks that should go into the net. Well, he's actually been below average to start the season. Those first few games was one of his worst stretches in his career, especially since 2017-18, I think he's only been, quote-unquote, that bad two or three times in a few-game stretch uh, at, in those several years. So it was one of the ultimate lows in terms of Pucks beating him that you wouldn't expect to, at least based on the analytics of it all. And then he gives that one up. It doesn't look good. It took a lot, I think. A lot of credit goes to him for being able to put that aside, play excellent throughout the rest of that night, and then, like I say, right off the hop against St. Louis, got tested. His workload was intense, even if there weren't a ton of shots. And, and ideally, this means this is what Winnipeg gets going forward. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, to me, that's the headline of the last couple of games, that Hellebuck is back and doing what the Winnipeg Jets expect him to do night in and night out and uh, what they're uh, paying him to do for another seven years after this one. Um, what was a real nice development last night was a little bit of puck luck and uh, some scoring for um, some guys down in the lineup. And we've got to start with David Gustafson. Uh, interested in what you've thought about Gustafson's game since coming into the lineup after Velarde was hurt last Tuesday against the LA Kings, how he's been used, the confidence that the coaching staff has had in that fourth line in tight moments in the third period, and then what that means for the young man to uh, finally break a goal-scoring drought that had gone a number of years. Yeah, the, the really one of the best things you can say about Winnipeg's fourth line is that during a high leverage moments in the game, the coaches just roll the lines. They just roll the lines. The fourth line can be trusted. No, they don't go out more often than the guys above them. That's why they're the fourth line. But they're not skipping shifts. They're not being stapled to the bench. They're being assigned tough tasks, and they're generally doing well with it. I think when you have the depth that Winnipeg has – you know, I think they'd be tested now if anything were to happen at this point. But David Gustafson as a 13th forward is a pretty good luxury. He's not going to step into the fourth line and dominate, but he's going to step onto the fourth line and be effective for the minutes that he gets asked to take on. He's going to be an effective penalty killer. He's going to play a responsible game. And the question has kind of been, what can he produce? And it's been a long time since he scored a goal in the NHL. And it's been a long time since he produced um, honest, like, end-of-day offense, not just scoring chances, but actually getting that puck into the net. So to see him come off the bench as he did and then Cole Perfetti spinning off the boards seemed to be the only one that noticed that he was there. That's just a nice play. You like that Gustafson gets the shot off that he wants and throughout the rest of that period, I mean, the guy was buzzing. He was firing all sorts, all sorts of pucks onto the net and that's what you like to see. You want to believe in a fourth line 
that you can depend on. And it is not just to go take a coffee break sort of line for the viewer. You want to believe that they might even get something done too. And him coming over the bench and scoring, Kupari has been excellent. Morgan Barron is quality. You like a lot of what they've got going on at that spot in the lineup. Yeah. And Arneel talked about, you know, having Gus on the wing and being able to take draws as well. Um, but Kupari has been, uh, I mean, a bit of a revelation, I think, to a lot of people. Now, again, it's not like he's leading the team in scoring or anything like that. But, I mean, he stands out game after game, Marat. Um, how, how much better is the Jets' fourth line right now, in your opinion, with Rasmus Kapari as opposed to previous incarnations over the last few years? I mean, I think he's an enormous part of why it can be not only trusted, but you might believe that something will happen. And I just I scrolled over the, to the tab just to remind myself. I mean, Kapari is sitting at just one assist in six games. It's not like he's rolling half a point per game from that spot in the lineup. But... Um, you know, against Edmonton. I think he drew three penalties in one game. Um, the, his speed bursts are tougher defenders to control. Drawing those penalties helps Winnipeg win that game. Um, he is going to draw more because of his speed and his impact on the game. You can trust that he's going to push the puck up the ice where possible. Um, so, yeah, in terms of having a fourth line that you can count on sort of at both ends of the ice, now, he's had goals going, you know, he's he's missed coverage and things like that, too. But again, he's on the fourth line. This is not a this is not a player that's getting paid eight million dollars to be a two way, um, you know, uh, player that dominates against everybody for his spot in the lineup, for his age, for this spot in his career. Um, he's contributing on that fourth line and giving it a chance to, to create and uh, and to hold its own, too. So it's. It's just like I said in the Gustafson sort of conversation. You can believe in that line, and that's a, that's a fresh feeling. That's like a 2018 feeling for me uh, when it was Perot, Armia, and Hendricks at times. I think that's where I'm thinking about for these guys. Well, and, and, and I mean, for my money, the third line when it was Ayafalo and Niederreiter is probably the best incar incarnation of a Lowry line that we've ever seen. Um, Ayafalo, though, has been able to play in many different places in the lineup. What have you thought about Ayafalo and the top line since the switch early in Edmonton when he and Mason Appleton were swapped? Yeah, I think, you know, Mason Appleton is a player that I like and a player who, you know, I love that conversation we had with him in the media yesterday. He's talking about St. Louis's defending schemes and how they pre-scouted it. This is a good hockey player, but he's not a first-line hockey player, not to me. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, he did lose his guy, Nurse, on that goal. Lots of great Edmonton Oilers out on the ice, and so that's a tough play for everybody. But you want to believe a first-line winger is going to be able to, to handle his coverage on that situation. Mason Appleton was a coaching hunch. Um, but you asked me about Iofalo. This isn't a Mason Appleton hit piece. It's, uh, it's a conversation about the Jets. Iofalo, for me, has been, you want to use the word revelation. That's been it for me. This is the player that surprised me the most with how effective he is. And look, I talked to Eric Stevens, our guy in California for The Athletic, right? He covered the LA Kings. He knows that roster. And he told me that, well, the, the Kings coaching staff would call him things like human and the, the eraser because he erases problems on the ice or human deodorant because anything that looks bad or smells bad, he'll fix kind of deal. Like there was all sorts of euphemisms for Alex Iafalo fixes your problems on the ice and can play in any role in L.A. So I thought, okay, well, he's going to be good. But um, the amount of good, let's say, the way that he can lead a four-check and take just the right lane and his stick is active and you can trust him to knock a puck down, great. The way that he can read off of offensive players like Shifley and Connor, and no, he's not doing that at a Gabriel Velarde type of elite offensive uh, level. Um, that's not the case. But he reads off of them well enough and four-checks hard enough to help them stay in good situations. That's also great. He's blocking shots. He's got positive puck possession numbers. Um, he's, a, he's a player that you can trust to do just about everything. And to actually see what that looks like, to see how much effort goes into it on a you know a shift-to-shift -shift basis and how consistent he is, I think that's been one of my more pleasant uh, surprises and experiences watching the Jets because I have a lot of respect for that type of player. Um, <clears throat> the other guy I wanted to ask you about was Cole Perfetti. And listen, we're six games in. He's been playing at center. He was moved to the wing. It was notable that he didn't see the ice in the last eight or so minutes of the third period in Edmonton or in OT. Um, 
what did you make of his situation, that in particular, and how he showed up last night coming out of Saturday night in Edmonton? Yeah, Cole Perfetti is in an interesting situation. He's taking on, or was taking on, a unique challenge moving into that second line center when there isn't an obvious Pierre Luc Dubois type answer there, right? Like this was going to be an experiment and it was going to involve a learning curve no matter what. So, okay, you're going to get growing pains off of that. And so I think that maybe he's been on the ice for two goals against at five on five. And, you know, one of them was a breakdown of the defenders. One of them, I think he was a step behind his guy. Okay, cool. Learning, learning curve on that front. And I think that that's a reasonable expectation for the player. If you look at his overall metrics, where the puck has been when he's on the ice, Winnipeg's been out shooting and out chancing the opponents throughout his shift. So to me, that implies that he's a player that you can trust. Now, of course, against a team like Edmonton, he's not getting McDavid and Dreisaitl, Shifley and Lowry are doing that. So that impacts the guy's numbers. The thing that comes out of all of that, that, that I sort of struggle with, is that when he and that line to a degree, but Perfetti especially, gets flat out benched in these high leverage moments of the game, I think that that's overplaying a supposed weakness. In the same way that I think, you know, promoting Mason Appleton to the first line is overplaying a supposed strength. Yes, Appleton can do some things, get the puck out of the zone, and there's some things that you like about it, but that's a job a little bit too too far up the lineup. And yes, Perfetti is learning, and there's some learning curve elements of playing center at that level in the NHL and then now wing, but those important minutes. Um, but I think pulling him off the ice entirely, when he's a player that actually makes some pretty smart plays of both blue lines and contributes to possession, uh, I think that's overplaying a supposed weakness. And he might be getting burnt because he's smaller. He might be getting burnt because he's not as fast. And I mean burnt in terms of coaching, trusting him for minutes. Uh, but I think he's a further advanced player than that at this stage. And so I've been a little bit, I've been looking at that ice time. He's const, like consistently ninth or 10th amongst Winnipeg forwards. And you look at the metrics where he's consistently out chancing people. He's creating scoring chances. He was creating a ton of scoring chances against the Blues last night. So credit to him for that. I don't know. I think this is a player whose minutes will go up over the course of the year. And then people will wonder why he didn't have those minutes all along because he produces with them. Um, do you think he moves back to center? I think that they, like, they got to give it a look. If this is part of the plan at all in any shape or form for the Winnipeg Jets going forward, you can't play him for three or four games or whatever that number was and then back off of it forever and never return to it. I also got to ex- accept and respect Vladislav Nemesnikov. His chemistry with Nikolai Ehlers is good. And so I understand why you'd want to bring him onto that line. And if those are your three, gosh, it's a tough word to use, but I want to say leftover players because Connor and Shifley are a a staple on that first line for Jets coaching. Um, That Lowry line is a staple as well. It seems as though those are the two lines that are getting the bulk of the minutes right now is Lowry and Shifley. So then, okay, you're looking for chemistry to form a secondary scoring line. So if you're going to use those players as your Leftovers, again, it's just not a kind word. Um, You're going to need to respect and value Nemesnikov, but he's also a player that can have that impact while moved to the wing too. And I think that if Cole Perfetti is going to get any realistic shot at being a center in Winnipeg, got to spell him back in, maybe ease up on him. Spell him back in, ease up. It doesn't have to be a yes or no. He's arrived as Mark Shifley's heir apparent, or he can never do it. I think there's a process involved, and you'd like to see the Jets get back to it. Well, and, and listen, I'm with you on uh, Nemetsnikov. I mean, he is, um, I mean, another very, very versatile player that has helped the Jets in a number of different ways. And he does have a little bit of co- uh, chemistry with Nikolai Ehlers, who has had a slow start. And I don't think anyone was really surprised considering how training camp went for him. But, um, I mean, to me, Ehlers has to be the offensive driver of that line, Marat. And, I mean... You mentioned at times in the past he's been a hard player for some guys to really to click with. Um, maybe your thoughts on that and why and just where he is at right now um, with his game early on, just a half a dozen into the campaign. Yeah, you know, I didn't really like Nikolai Euler's start to the season, to be honest. He's a player that produces a ton over the long sample, but coming off of missing so much of preseason, all of preseason to, to an injury, that next situation, all of that, You know, I don't think he stepped in and controlled the flow of play quite as much as he traditionally does. 
Um, and then when he's gotten into the offensive zone, which he's still doing, his metrics are still good. All that stuff is happening. He hasn't looked quite as dynamic and dangerous to me. He's getting into shooting positions and then skying shots. He's missing passing opportunities and things like that. And I think that he's, maybe for me, last night's game was one where I began to see signs of the Nick Ehlers that is really just an excellent top-line quality player. Um, he was setting up entries. He was back-checking hard. He was helping win the puck back. He was then setting up fresh entries and keeping the Jets playing in the offensive zone. He's getting closer, I think, to impacting a game in a, in a big way, and the Jets need him to do that. He's counted upon. That's part of his role, and that's what the ask is for Nikolai Ehlers. And the thing that I think that maybe is frustrating about him from time to time is that he creates a volume of chances that you can look at in the numbers. You can look at in your eyes. The guy spends a lot of time in the offensive zone, but in and amongst that high volume of chances, there's inevitably a play or two per game where you're wondering like, why did he do that? Like it didn't look like his teammates were anticipating that move. And I wonder if those moments of surprise where he tries a lane that, that didn't exist or he goes to one player when it looked to the other player. Like you can almost see him flat foot people too. And for me, if you end up in a situation where the guy, the whole, the, the total impact of the guy is he's producing way more than he gives up because he creates so much, then it's almost on coaching to me to just keep playing him, even though there are frustrating moments where other players will look at it and I'm speaking for them. I don't know if they would actually say this or think this, but like where they would look at it and be like, oh, he sort of killed that play. Because I get that that's got to be frustrating at the same time if he's producing more than he gives up and it helps you win games. I think that that's a, that's a valuable, valuable player. And ideally, again, he steps forward into that because I think you're seeing sparks of a guy that's going to start taking over games. Well, and, and one of the things that stood out to me, and, and listen, we've talked about this for years at times where Ehlers hasn't been on that top power play, um, is that, you know, for whatever reason, that the, the fit didn't seem to be there. He has jumped onto that PP1 unit in the absence of Velarde. Um, and I know they didn't have the results last night, um, but at times over the past three games, it... I don't know, to me, to the eye test, it seems like there is a little bit more connection within the framework of that power play. Have you s s thought similar? And uh, what do you make of where that PP1 unit is right now? Yeah, I still think that they're, they have some a ways to go, to be honest, in my opinion, in terms of in terms of the quality of chances that they end up creating. I think Gabriel Velarde was really helping on that front, and that injury hurts. But for me, Ehlers coming off of... I, I want to say going downhill like he does is is a dangerous player. It adds an element where where there's dyna, dyna, dynamism. That's the word we're going to use today. There's a dynamic to it where there's he has multiple options at his disposal. And just like Shifley, when he's on the half wall, he's a shooting threat or a passing threat, and not just a passing threat to one guy. He's got multiple options. Or Kyle Connor can shoot or pass. And like there's as long as you can have more dangerous options than a penalty kill can cover, I think you're going to create more chances over the long haul. And I think that Nikolai Ehlers coming downhill off of that point type of position is that, you know, he's a shooting threat, but he's also a good passer as well. And I think that they'll find it. I think that there's reasons to believe that that group of players should be able to run a quality power play. And so I'm optimistic about it. Murat, uh, God knows we spent a lot of time talking about Mark Shifley over the last couple of years. He's had a great start to the season. Uh, as I said to Craig Button, it sort of feels like he's turned the page on um, you know some of the negatives that had been surrounding him at times over the last couple of years um, and is playing you know a great brand of hockey, very engaged. Uh, your colleague, uh, Pierre Lebrun, had an uh, interesting article last week in The uh, Athletic about Shifley signing the contract, kind of where he's at right now. Um, just wanted your thoughts on, you know, 55 and uh, where his game is at and, you know, his head is at as well, having this contract taken care of and uh, what this means moving forward. Yeah, you got, I got to be honest, not only, I've, I've loved Shifley's start to the season. Like the, the guy has taken heat, including from me for his 200-foot game. I'm seeing a guy that's back-checking hard and covering down low and helping out his teammates with consistency, not just a one-off here or there or the other place. And honestly, if there's a weak league defensively on that line, I mean, Kyle Connor has been caught out of position a few times and given the puck away a few times. I think Mark Shifley's been working awfully hard this season, and, and I like 
I like the game that he's playing. And I also got to say, maybe off the ice too. I, I have had some just phenomenal interviews with him so far that I'm really looking forward to, to sharing. I've got some good Mark Shifley stories to tell. And in part, because I feel like he's really opened up in the conversations that I've had with him. And to me, that implies almost a comfort or a relaxation or an exhale or something. Maybe we were just ha- vibed well on a particular day. But when Pierre Lebrun writes that story and Shifley's talking about how how it was keeping him up at night and how he gets to exhale and sleep well and feel good now that he's got his contractual situation sorted out. And I can sort of, you know, in a roundabout way, vouch for that because, like, th- this is going to be a very strange example. But the other day, we got on to talking about sushi and salmon. And I literally have salmon cooking in the <laughs> oven right now because he went on a rant about the omega-3s and the vitamins and the healthy fats and it was just the hockey nerd of old that I think Winnipeg wanted to celebrate. And then there's been some tough times in the Mark Shifley career arc for the last couple of years. I don't want to get too far ahead. This is a long season. Anything can happen. But this six games and this disposition that Mark Shifley's taken forward into the season, it's been a real bright spot for me. You know, I, I mean, I, you kind of answered this already, but I'll, I'll just put it to you. I mean, you're around there on a daily basis. Um, you know, at times Mark didn't speak very much, but I mean, you're in the room, you're seeing player. How different does he seem this year? Yeah, you know, it's it's tough for me to ever say these things like uh, absolutely with a sense of absolute air to them, mm-hmm. because like I remember, I think it's January, February of last year, uh, I was in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, covering that Jets road trip, and he and I had a real quality one on one, and I remember. Um, I remember leaving that conversation and thinking, oh, yeah, you know what? Usually I, I sort of think of him as like a little bit unwilling to open up. Like he'll he'll go the cliche route if he needs to or what have you. And I thought to myself, maybe it's just because we were one on one. There's less pressure on it. We were on the road. It was like I, I just thought it was such a high quality conversation. I remember he got benched uh, with Kyle Connor and Nino Niederreiter later in that year. And a little bit of that prickliness came back out. I wasn't part of that conversation, but that's how it was relayed to me. He didn't seem happy about the benching. And I thought, okay, sure. Like you're always sort of adjusting and readjusting and trying to bring fresh eyes to your interactions. You don't want to think that somebody is prickly or sweet because somebody else had a prickly or sweet interaction with them. We're all people. We're all three dimensional. Um, but I'm just I'm going through the timeline just to say that my conversations with him and there have been many already this season have been unilaterally positive and open and engaging. And I like it. I think that it showed me that side, like I said a moment ago, that I think Winnipeg was so keen to celebrate. And I'm like, I'm seeing that and I'm feeling it in that dynamic. And I appreciate it. Hey, shout out to Gord Fraser. Gord, welcome aboard. Thanks for becoming a member, a supporter of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Really appreciate it. Um I think a big part of this too, and again, you know, this will probably be a topic as we get into Monday with the return of Blake Wheeler, um, is the absence of Wheeler, but also Adam Lowry as a captain and not necessarily on the ice, you know, sticking up for teammates or doing all the things that Adam Lowry does. Um, But as a guy that, you know, always was thought of as sort of the bridge between the established hierarchy of the room and the other players, um, it, it does seem like this team is sort of more a team than we've seen in a long time. And I think some of that's rubbing off on Shifley. And I think Adam Lowry and his leadership, um, you know, is in a lot of ways a big, big part of the equation. I mean, I was in the room yesterday and uh, I think you had Mike on yesterday and he was too. So maybe you talked about this already, but uh, I was in the room when Adam gave a couple of kids a tour of the Jets dressing room yesterday. And he introduces the kids to, Nate Schmidt, one of them walks up to him and just flat out says, you're bald. <laughs> Schmidt's like, well, I used to have a great head of hair. Anyways, it was like, it was just, and then Adam's like, hey, this is Dylan and this is so-and-so. And it's it's a version of Adam Lowry we've seen a bunch of times. And I'm sure other players do this too, right? Like Winnipeg's players, even the unpopular ones are the ones that like Blake Wheeler people have, have said is just so curmudgeonly. But, you know, there are lovely stories about him interacting you know, with charities and, and on behalf of kids and stuff. Like, there's so much sure. nice stuff even then. But to see that scene with Adam Lowry and just think, like, honestly, that's the only version of Adam Lowry that I have seen, right? Like, 
the consistency with which he has been, you know, willing to be that one step kind, that one step uh, engaging, all just always sort of taking what I want to call the, not a high road exactly, but like a warmer and get more engaging road, um, I think speaks well of his character. And if that's part of this transition for Winnipeg, which it probably is, then then they made the right choice. And, uh, and then we're only just beginning to see what this next generation of Jets looks like. And um, I like Adam Lowry's approach to leadership as I've understood it so far. Murata Tesh of The Athletic is with us. Uh, let's uh, just take a quick look ahead. Detroit and Montreal. And Remo where I were talking at the start of the show, I mean, just off the top of my head, I don't have the, the matchups, but I have memories of some pretty ugly nights for the Winnipeg Jets in Detroit, even when Detroit was not even as good as they are right now and in Montreal. Um, how do you look at the challenge for the Winnipeg Jets to build off these back-to-back -back wins going into Detroit, who's had a great start, lost an OT last night, and the Montreal Canadiens, who were still in a bit of a rebuild mode? Yeah, it's funny. You know, you look at Winnipeg's start to the season, and you just look at all the play teams that they played against so far, and you pencil it in as a difficult stretch of the season. Um, you know, Edmonton was meant to be a contender and might still become one. Uh, Vegas, all that sort of stuff. And before the season, before the Red Wings got off to this hot start, you might have said, okay, well, that's more of an average team. This is when the, the schedule difficulty changes or opens up a little bit. Doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like Alex Dabrinkit is scoring at will. And I know he's... Under the weather is probably, I think, going to play tomorrow, but no guarantee about that. Dylan Larkin, I think, is tied for the lead in points in the NHL with Jack uh, Jack Hughes, if I've got that right. Um, they're scoring at will. Their goaltending has been good enough. Andrew Cobb's been productive, credit to him. Uh, so there's a quality team over there in the Detroit Red Wings, and I think that they're ready to take the next step. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, I remember... What's your memory on this? Doesn't Kyle Connor always score in Michigan? Is that kind of how it works? I, I feel like there's been at least one headline where like Kyle Connor had an amazing game. Connor Hallibuck had an amazing game and it was in Detroit and that's sort of like a homecoming type. Um, so maybe look to those guys, I guess, is what I would say against Detroit. Well, I mean, I think they're doing it as a team right now. I mean, uh, everybody's had a piece of these uh, last couple wins and, um, we'll see what happens over the next couple of uh, couple games. Then, of course, Blake Wheeler back. The Halloween game next Monday. Next time you'll have a chance to see the Winnipeg Jets live in person at Canada Life Center. Marat, just before we go, what do you have cooking for Jets fans in the Athletic coming up? Well, I can't talk about all these good conversations with Mark Shifley without having a, a pretty darn good story on the on the way. A pretty darn good story on the freaking way. Just, to, just <laughs> that's a, that's a great way to put something to do with a big piece on uh, Mark. We'll look forward to it in the Athletic, Marat. Have a great day. Enjoy that salmon. Thank you. Thanks, us. All right, good stuff. There is Murata Tesh. Um, great Jets conversation. Jets in action tomorrow. I believe it's a six thirty local start. Um, and we'll uh, have much more on the club tomorrow. Getting ready for this quick uh, two-game road trip out to Detroit and to Montreal. Um, we're going to talk Bombers. Of course, big news today. Brady Oliveira announced as the Bombers MOP uh, candidate, as well as the most outstanding Canadian, Willie Jefferson, top defensive player, another uh, unanimous selection. Jamarcus Hardrick getting the offensive line nomination. Sergio Castillo on uh, special teams and Jameson Sheehan, the rookie, uh, rookie of the year, doing a great job as part of that Bomber special teams unit as well. We're going to be speaking with the man that in almost any other season would have been a lock for the Most Outstanding Canadian Award. Uh, we're going to do that with Nick Dembski right away. Of course, all our Bomber reports brought to you by Princess Auto. Get your tickets now for the West Final. 5.30 kickoff, the Princess Auto tailgate zone will get going at 3.30, and I imagine it will be lit before the fans get in there and try and cheer on the Bombers to another trip to the Grey Cup. You can uh, force Princess Autos where you find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list <clears throat> or start something new is over at Princess Auto. You can see them on Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, or shop online 24-7-365 at princessauto.com. Our pals over at Consolidated Supply, uh, are uh, oh, they've got so much going on right now. They're the leaders in irrigation systems, 
artificial turf as well, outdoor and indoor. And of course, the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba with golf carts and other great vehicles, similar vehicles for industrial use. But Consolidated Supply has other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchen options. Not to mention they are the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Pop by and see them at the showroom, open to the public. 1395 Niagara Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. Well, hey, November 11th is the big game for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. You've probably been wearing your jersey all season. Uh, you might need to pop by Royal Sports, get a toque, maybe get a scarf bundle up to get ready for what could be a cold one at IG Field. When you're thinking about bomber merch, new Jet jersey or Jets merchandise, there's only one place to go, and that is Royal Sports. Great NFL selection and more. And, of course, with hockey season here, they are the undisputed hockey store best in the biz for over 40 years. 750 Pemina Highway is where you need to go. Royal Sports, and give them a follow on Instagram as well, at Royal Sports Pemina. And, hey, just before we bring in Nick Dembski, a big shout-out to our friends at Boston Pizza. Slower night tonight on the Pucks, but it is NBA opening night. We get the Raptors' first game of the year. And tomorrow, Jets at 6.30, and then Thursday night football with the Bills and the Buccaneers. No better place to get together with the gang for the big game than Boston Pizza. Ice cold schooners, world famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And hey, if you're staying in tonight, you can always order to uh, for a little delivery at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's get to it. What a season our next guest has had, and what a season his team has had. The Bombers are once again on top of the West, getting ready for the West final. And Nick Dembski has a thousand yards receiving season under his belt. Nick joins us now. What's going on? It's great to have you back on the show. Yeah, not much. Just finished up at the field uh, <clears throat> over here to talk talk with you. And, yeah, life's good, man. Hey, uh, um, life is good for uh, the Bombers, for their fans right now, and for you uh, in particular. Uh, congratulations. A thousand yards. Uh, you had to come back in and get that one extra yard and uh, put it over the top. Um, you know, we'll get to the team in a minute. But, um, I mean, your season overall, I'm sure you're uh, pretty pleased. What did that mean to get that milestone for you? And, uh how are you feeling about the body of work you put forward through the first 17 games of the campaign? Yeah, I mean, you know, my my goal really was just to play as many games as I could, stay healthy. Um, you know, I knew if I was able to stay healthy, then, you know, I'd be able to be productive and, you know, help this team make plays. So, you know, I'm just happy with, with, uh, with that. Um, you know, obviously I missed that one game for my daughter's birth. So, you know, I think, I think that's a decent excuse, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Other than that, man, you know what? Uh, everybody's good. Everybody, you know, it's it's the right type of energy around here going into playoffs. So, I mean, we're 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 looking forward to it. Speaking of energy, I can't imagine there's more positive energy than uh, having your first child. Um, congratulations yeah. again on that. That uh, how's dad you. life been? It's good. I mean, it's different. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's different. You know, it's a, it's a little bit more busier. Maybe maybe uh, a little more sleepier. But uh, you know, at at the end of the day. Uh, my fiance and I, you know, I, I feel like it's the right change that, that, that we needed. And, uh, you know, it definitely added, uh, you know, I wanted to say added more life to our relationship, but literally it added more life to our relationship. And, uh, I mean, you know, I couldn't pick a better partner to do it with. So, you know what, we're both, uh, both, you know, very, very gracious for this and, uh, just thankful for it really. How different has the, uh, just your days been? I mean, you've got a pretty structured time at the field, um, you know, before when you don't have kids, you can kind of probably do a few more things. I mean, uh, <laughs> how, how has just that changed uh, your day to day life? And uh, has it all been challenging uh, kind of mixing both with, uh, as I said, a very structured football calendar? Yeah, you know what? It, it's it's kind of funny because, I mean, I could kind of, you know, let football blend into you know, in, into leaving the stadium, you know, I'd probably go hang out with a couple of teammates and, you know, we'd still, you know, talk football, maybe watch a little bit of film. But, you know, honestly, the biggest change is probably just getting everything done at the stadium. Um, and, and it's good because, I mean, now we get to hang out as teammates at the stadium, um, you know, put, put in that extra type of work. So, you know, there's definitely been longer days at the stadium. But then, you know, when I come home, uh, you know, I kind of just shift my mind and, and turn my football mind off. And then, uh, you know, I'm able to just to spend time with the family. And, you know, once we put her to bed, you know, I might go back and watch a little film or, you know, might go back and, and, and catch them up on – yeah, up on some stuff but you know at the end of the day I mean it's it's kind of funny you know now I'm living you know my football life during the day but then you know it's all family life when I come home so I mean it's definitely a little bit of a change to shift but 
as I said, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful one. Well, you know, <laughs> you mentioned that family life. I mean, you're really part of two families. And I mean, I know sometimes it's cliche, but I mean, that group that you have in that bomber locker room and the entire organization really does feel like a family. Um, how, uh, how are the fellas feeling after, uh, you know, another sellout at home, four straight, and clinching the West Division, knowing what's at hand coming up on November 11th? Yeah, I mean, you know what? As, as I said, the energy's in, in the right spot over here. I mean, we're all... We're looking forward to, to going to Calgary, of course. You know, we still have some business to handle over there. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the fans have been great. Um, you know, we, we get another chance to, to represent our team at, at, at our home field. And, and we all know that we're going to cut or uh, Winnipeg's going to come out and, and sell that one out as well. So, yeah, we're excited about it. You know, uh, it's, it's definitely going in the right direction. I mean, you know, we're just looking to build each and every year, each and every week. So, you know, this is just going to be another opportunity to, to – come out here and, and, and show, you know, the city what we can do. Hey, uh, you know, and, and, you know, longtime listeners of the show back on TSN will remember. Your draft year, the Bombers were picking number two. You would come off this incredible year at, uh, you know, it's the career, you know, locally and then at the U of M. And I, and I said on the show, I mean, my biggest worry is that just watch. The Riders are going to take Nick Dembski, and this guy's <laughs> going to be haunting us. And again, this is at a time when, I mean, it, this – it was like Murphy's Law with the Bombers. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of talented teams, something would go wrong. Um, a few years later, you come here to Winnipeg as a free agent. Nick, could you have ever imagined how magical this run would be with this team and with this organization coming home, considering looking back at what you guys have accomplished and are two wins away from doing again? You know, it, it, it's funny because, I mean, you know, it's Saskatchewan – you know, I, I was in two different head coaches over there, um, you know, not a lot of success over there. And, uh, you know, honestly, when I signed here in Winnipeg, it was more about, you know, the opportunity for myself uh, to play in the slot as a slot back and, uh, you know, kind of get more opportunities and chances that way to, you know, get closer to the box and get closer to the quarterback and get the ball in different ways. And, you know, I remember my first training camp here, you know, I just fell in love with the culture. I mean, everything was team oriented and, you know, that's, that's why I fell in love with the game of football in the first place is just, you know, it's a, as you said, it's a big family, you know, and the more love you have for each other, you know, the more success you're going to have for each other as well. So, um, you know, I fell in love with the team culture and, you know, just, you know, as you, as you said, you know, five years later, just kind of where we've got to now. I mean, I, I remember uh, they just hosted their first playoff game, uh, the year before I came here and then I came here, we went to the semifinals and next thing you know, you know, we, we got to the West finals and we won the West finals, won the great cup. And, you know, now that's just the standard here, you know, to get to the great cup and go win it. So, um, just how far along this team has come and the, and the culture that we built here. I mean, you know, I, I really am thankful for, for signing here back in 2018. You know, you, you, you mentioned that path that you and the team has taken since coming here. Um, I mean, the culture was something that you wanted to be a part of, but how has the culture changed with the success that you guys have had and how you've sort of built on it as you just lay it out step by step by step to where you guys are today being, you know, a year in and year out, a legit Grey Cup contender. And once again, welcoming somebody else to your park for a trip to the Grey Cup in the West Final. Sure. I mean, I think, I think, you know, you just, you know, step by step by step. I mean, I, we look at it as week by week by week, you know, like we, we handle one week at a time and just the culture. I mean, you know, once you get to the big dance and, and you win it, you know, you could be satisfied, you could be happy, but you know, we're never satisfied or happy. I mean, you know, we still start off every year, just like the same, you know, we still start from the bottom, work our way up during training camp. I mean, you know, we just treat every week like a new week and every week is an opportunity to compete and go one and oh each and every week. I know, you know, the media ask us every week, you know, what, what's what's this what's different about this game? And pretty sure we all have cliche answers, but that's just the way that that we're built here. You know, we we really prioritize each and every game like 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 it's own week. You know, we're not looking ahead. We're not thinking about the past. You know, we're focusing on the now and what we can do now to get better for that game. And, uh, you know, when the game's over, we make our corrections and it's on to the next one. But, you know, that's that's just how you got to you got to build. Um, you know, you can't, as I say, you just can't look too far ahead. You can't get ahead of yourself. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get lost in the sauce. So, you know, week by week, we just uh, keep building and, and keep getting better. Keep finding Nick, ways to get better. 
Nick Dembski is with us from the Blue Bombers on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk. 1,000-yard receiver for the year. And he and his teammates getting ready to welcome either Calgary or BC November 11th in the West Final. Um, I bumped into your GM on uh, on Sunday afternoon when I got back from Edmonton. And, you know, I just, hey, congratulations, another big win. What a season. Talked a little bit about the West Final. And then I, I had to ask him, and I'll ask you the same thing. You've been around football for a long time. Um, as far as a regular season game goes, um, where does that one in BC a couple of weeks back rank up the way you guys came back? I mean, the toe to toe, two great teams with everything that was on the line. And what do you remember about the way your team was able to come back and, and win such a massive game with so much at stake? Yeah, we were just resilient. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, there's a lot of mistakes made in that game. You know, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody on our team would, would hide from that, but, um, you know, when it mattered most, we came together and we played great football. You know, there's a lot of a lot of individual plays, but there's a lot of team plays as well that, you know, really led to that success. So um, I think it just, you know, it just shows, you know, we do have the determination, the grit to, you know, finish games like that and to come back from games. And I mean, I think it was a good, you know, it was a good confidence game. You know, that was a, uh, that was a big game, obviously, to, you know, kind of break the tiebreaker for, for first in the West. And, uh, you know, it was something – it was a game that we needed for sure. And uh, we definitely fought hard for that game, and we fought for all four quarters and the overtime as well. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously the focus is going to be on uh, getting through this next game healthy and preparing for November 11th. But while I've got you on here, um, you know, you and Brady Oliveira – have written a story that has never been done before. I mean, 1,000-yard rusher, 1,000-yard receiver, Canadian, never mind local, never mind from the same freaking high school. Um, it has been a- another great part of the Bomber's success. But uh, I've got to ask you about the season that Brady's had and the significance of you and he making history the way you've done uh, in your hometown. Yeah, I mean, you know what? Uh, it's funny because, you know, we kind of had a little taste of what we could do in this league last year. And then this year, I mean, we, we kind of both held each other accountable. I mean, you know, he was kind of holding me accountable for, you know, staying healthy all year. And I was kind of holding him accountable, just, you know, doing it all. Because, you know, I, I know how much potential he has. And uh, he's a hard runner. You know, we give him a lot of carries, a lot of touches. And uh, he makes the most out of each and every one of them. So, for him, you know, to, to come in here and, and, and do what he did, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of pressure on him, obviously, with, with Andrew leaving and everything like that. So for him to come in here and step into the role that, that, that he did, I mean, you know, complete hats off to him. Uh, but, you know, we've we've been talking about this, you know, not necessarily the, as specific as what we've done, but we've been talking about just, you know, having the type of seasons that we're having, you know, since since the end of last year. You know, he went away. Uh, for a little bit to Bali and uh, you know I was training here but you know he was texting me before he even got home um, you know just asking me what my workout schedule is like and what my routines like and you know how many days on the field I, I'm at and all that stuff and you know as soon as he touched back down in Winnipeg I mean we got right back to work and you know it wasn't even you know obviously we we're training hard physically but it wasn't even you know just that you know we we're picking each other's brain mentally as well so that's just the type of you know, relationship that we have. I mean, you know, we, we obviously hang out off the field as well, but, you know, when it comes to comes to our work, I mean, we take it seriously, not only physically, but, but you know, IQ, always trying to get smarter and, and mentally as well, just trying to get stronger each and every way. Um, you know, the uh, we all remember how uh, last year ended, unfortunately, for the club and that narrow loss in the Grey Cup. How much did that drive you guys in the off season, and uh, how much does that continue to drive you, knowing what's at stake on the 11th of November and hopefully a week later in the Hammer? Of course. I mean, I, you know what? I don't, I don't think so much of, of that game really, really drove me. But, you know, obviously it was a, it was a heartbreaker at the end of the day. Um, but you know what? In, in this profession, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, that was 2022 and this is 2023. So, you know, what drives me now is being a 2023 champion with, 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 these, with these guys over here, you know, all, all my boys in the locker room. So, you know, I know everybody is, is, is eager to get back there, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we gotta, we gotta take a week by week. We still have a hard opponent uh, with Calgary that, you know what, we could even play them. And then after that, we got BC at home that, you know, is obviously a must win do or die. So, um, 
you know, great cup, you know, we can, we can sniff it, but you know, we can't, we can't smell the whole scent yet. You know, we, we still got a, we still got a lot of, a lot of work to put in before that. And uh, you know, everybody's motivated to do it though. So, you know, it, it, it'll be an exciting time for sure. Nick, what, uh, I mean, I know uh, you and a few guys missed practice yesterday, um, but what is the, uh, the, the focus this week? I mean, you do have a play, a, a game to play. And one of the things that Kyle mentioned, I mean, you'd like to give certain guys some, some time off, but there's salary cap considerations and whatnot. Um, uh, is this just, I, I can't imagine it's just a normal week considering what really matters is the 11th of November, but how are you and the guys approaching the week of practice in this game coming up on the weekend to finish off the regular season? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's another opportunity to, to, to go out there and compete. I mean, you know, we're all, we're all one team in this locker room. We all wear the same color helmet. So at the end of the day, you know, we're all just trying to lean on each other and, and whatever, you know, squad goes out there to compete, you know, we're, we're expecting to come out of there with a W. So, um, you know, it's, it's just another week to, to, you know, dial in, lock in, you know, keep the rhythm going, going into playoffs. I mean, this is the most important time of the year, so we can't take the, the foot off the pedal just yet. Um, I mean, at all, <laughs> not yet at all. So, you know, we still, as I said, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. So, um, you know, no matter who's going over there, we're still keeping it the same mindset, go in there, play good football, uh, you know, and, and come out of there with a win. Hey, you mentioned uh, earlier, I mean, the goal was to uh, to stay healthy, uh, play a full season, be the best you can be. You have done that. And, uh, I mean, as I say, touch wood. But the health of this team has been incredible. I mean, we're talking about the most outstanding Canadian and the most outstanding player and all that. I'm not sure if there's some award for a training staff, but um, <laughs> I, I, like, like just as a player, um, you know, we always hear the name Al Couture. I'm just interested in your perspective on the guys behind the scenes and how much they have helped you and the rest of your teammates be out there week in and week out and play at such a high level. I, I mean, I was, I was the best, best in the business, man. I mean, you know, I, I've only, I've only been with two different training staffs, but you know, just, just what he does and, and the trust he has and the, and the trust that the guys have in him, um, even the trust that the coaches have in Al, you know, with making the right type of judgments. I mean, him, him and the whole staff, you know, they do a great job. I mean, I could list them all off, but you know, they, they, they all do a great job and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're always, you know, they want to get you back on the field, but at the same time, they want to make sure, you know, what's best for the, for the long run and what's best for the team as well. You know, we're, uh, so they're, yeah, they're, they're really good at what they do. Um, you know, I have all the respect for Al. He, uh, he's helped me, you know, in the last five years, you know, I have been nicked up and he's always helped me and, and, and helped me get through it. You know, he's helped me be, ready for the season and also uh able you know even if i'm nicked up right before the playoffs you know i've, I've played in every playoff game that, I, that i've been a bomber so you know to me that's just you know hats off to him you know he's been in this league for a while and, he, and he's still doing a great job so yeah hats off to him and and the whole staff hey nick uh before we go um uh, i know you're a winnipeg guy you're a great you're a great hockey player too you're paying attention what have you thought about the uh the jet start so far and uh these uh wins on saturday and yesterday do i get back to three and three to be honest, <laughs> I'm more of a I'm more of a Jets fan after the football season. Football season, I got you. <laughs> kind of busy right now. Well, I, I'm sure the baby doesn't help with that scheduling as far as kicking back for, for <laughs> the at all. <laughs> but you know what? That's awesome, man. I mean, obviously, any any sports team in Winnipeg, you know, obviously you want them to excel and. And, and it's better for the city, you know, when, when our sports teams do, do good. And, and I mean, I obviously know the big buzz about the Jets. So you know, I'll definitely be, be paying attention to that after the season. But, you know, I, I, got, I got some work to do right now and, and some work to finish off. So that's, uh, that, that, that's where I'm at with that. <laughs> good stuff. Well, listen, I mean, you know, it, 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 let's, let's make this plan. Win a couple more games, November 11th, and then the following weekend in the Hammer. Take a little bit of time off. And then we get you back here afterwards to talk about a great season and we can talk some pucks as well. But in the meantime, yeah. good luck on the weekend. And uh, listen, I mean, it's all about staying healthy and being ready for the 11th of November. And uh, I guess just before we go, maybe a quick message to Bomber fans on what you and the rest of the fellas are hoping to see them bring on what could be a, a chilly afternoon with a trip to the Grey Cup on the line. You know, I, I, I don't doubt... Bomber fans at all, you know, you guys have always brung it. Um, you know, the last two West Finals, I mean, it's been it's been probably two out of the four coldest games I've ever played in my life, and you guys still sell it out. So, thank you. Um, you know, get ready for some good football. You know, we 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 got we got one goal on our mind, and and that's the, the Great Cup. So we're going to do everything we can to do it. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you.
Nick, always great chopping it up with you. Congrats on the new addition to the fam. Congrats on an amazing regular season and a good luck on November 11th. And uh, hopefully we'll be uh, seeing you and the rest of the squad at the Hammer for uh, the Great Cup in mid-November. Appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Always good talking to you. Good stuff. There's the man himself, Nick Dembski. How about that? Nick Dembski, Brady Oliveira, 1,000 one rushing, run receiving, never been done before in CFL history by two Canadians and to be done by two local players from the same high school. It, um, I mean, this team, um, you know, continues to uh, create new uh, milestones, new memories. But as we just heard from Nick, it's all about one thing right now, and that's getting their go well, first getting to the Grey Cup and then getting their hands back on it um, when the game is played at Tim Hortons Field on the 19th of November. We'll be there for Winnipeg Sports Talk, doing shows from Hamilton. Really looking forward to that. But, uh, again, the focus all on the 11th of November. And I know Nick's going to be busy getting ready for his football game, but what a day that is going to be. I mean, we're still waiting to see exactly if anything's going to change as far as the Jets start time, which will bleed just into the start of the Bomber game. Um, but it's going to be a pretty special day here in Winnipeg on November 11th. Of course, Remembrance Day as well um, to begin. Uh, one of the biggest sports days in this city in, uh, in a pretty long time. All right, let's uh, give a big shout-out to our friends over at Little Brown Jug. Um, shout-out to Brady, who does the Game On uh, shows uh, on the SDPN. I was sitting beside Brady at the game last night, and I did see him join a couple Little Brown Jugs, as were we. Um, man, it's great to have our favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug, available at Canada Life Centre right now. You can pick it up at the Craft Beer Corner in the north end of the main concourse, kind of where the Moxies used to be. Check it out if you haven't been there. It looks phenomenal with everything they've done. There's also a location in the south end. And for you upper bowlers, 310 is the new craft beer corner in the upper bowl. You can get Little Brown Jug there. And, of course, uh, you can also find Little Brown Jug, well, really anywhere that they sell great beer. And the best spot to do it, William Avenue, their spot, brewery and tap room in the exchange uh, and, of course, check them out online at littlebrownjug.ca for uh, all their products, merchandise, and local delivery options. And, hey, a big shout-out to Nick and Nikki DQ. Um, man, they've been great supporters of ours since day one of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And I always say probably the most popular sponsor for our uh, supporters to support them because, you know, you're going to be getting your hands on one of those delicious stack burgers or a blizzard or one of the amazing ice cream novelties that Nick and Nicky are serving up. Pop by and see them at DQ Northgate, Polo Park, St. Anne's, or the DQ in Niverville. And don't forget, Nick and Nicky have just opened up the Pita Pit out in Niverville. Healthy, fresh, uh, healthy, fresh, fast, and delicious. you got to love Pita Pit. And if you do have some catering needs, Nick and Nicky would love to help you out. Hit them up on X at Pita Pit Niverville. Uh, all right, let's get Remus back in here and... Man, this has been a great show. Craig Button absolutely brought it. Always a great conversation with Murata Tesh. And I got to tell you, Reem, I, I, just talking with Nick Dembski, I am so fired up for that football game on November 11th. I literally cannot wait. And I know Bomber fans are in the same boat. Fired up, Huss. So this is what we've been waiting for pretty much since last year at the Grey Cup. I'll see people in chat saying, you know, it still hurts them thinking about that game. And the Bombers are back. In the West Final, you know, we think it's going to be BC, but you never know. And November 11, big day uh, for Winnipeg sports with the Jets and Bombers in action. Yeah, you know it. And uh, great comments in the chat. Um, by the way, great crowd today, too. Well over 400. Hit that thumbs up. Let's get it to 200, folks, if you don't mind. Uh, if you're with us and you haven't already, just hit that thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Help us like and uh, and spread the channel. Uh, well, uh, uh, and we shouldn't be surprised, Reem, that finishing up the um, that finishing up this week that we'd have sort of a slower slower date um, of hockey games tonight after everyone was in action tonight. We'll get to those in the cool bet lines in a minute. Uh, but just coming out of the Nick Dembski interview, um, I'll get your thoughts on this as well. But thoughts in chat. I mean, we basically did the vote the other day on the why not question of the day for not Autocorp at Waverly and McGillery as to who everybody thought was the uh, bomber outstanding player, most outstanding player. And the fans voted Brady Oliveira. The media voted Brady Oliveira as well. Um, let us know in the chat your thoughts on that and uh, the rest of the bomber nominees. 
which included Oliveira for the Canadian and most outstanding player. Jamarcus Hardrick getting the offensive line. Willie J, a unanimous defensive player of the year. Sergio Castillo, a unanimous special teams. And I love Jamison Sheehan getting the rookie nominate, no, no, um, uh, Remo. He, um, he has so many different ways he can kick the football. We haven't talked a lot about punting because uh, the Bombers are as prolific as they are. But um, what a season that he's had. But, yeah, let us know for the why not question today in the chat your thoughts on the awards. What do you think? Yeah, I'm just saying I don't like the way these CFL League awards go where you have to pick – one player from each team like you know like you could argue Oliveira and Dembski are the number one and two Canadians in the league and what Dembski because he plays on a team with Oliveira doesn't doesn't get uh get the nod uh, well in bets, the league. bets with the oh, sack yeah. record out in BC that's true I mean that's the funny thing if you did three if you had three finalists this year it's those guys only one of them is going to be the West nominee. I mean, mm-hmm. there'll be someone from the East that I think by almost every measure wouldn't crack the top three otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it's like nice to get every team gets a guy, but, you know, you want to reward the right players for having a great season. I think they know. They don't need some – some of them don't need, you know, the recognition to know they had a great season, so I'm not going to complain too much. But as far as, you know, Zach – versus Brady, I mean, you saw Zach had, you know, some games where what, he's throwing pick sixes and – I think Brady was the horse uh, for this team. You know, you look at the rushing, what he played in you know, almost every game, and among the league leaders, he had quite a, a lead. And uh, you know what he did in receiving as well. And so, I mean, I'm I'm fine with Brady getting the nod for uh, most outstanding player and a most outstanding Canadian. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd still say that if we were talking MVP and most valuable player, yeah, I think I'm going to give the nod to the quarterback, but it is impossible to overlook just how outstanding Brady Oliveira has been so far this year. And um, they couldn't have gone wrong with either choice, but c- congratulations to Brady, um, who I think will be... Well, it's funny. We say a lock for the most outstanding Canadian, but that bets with the with the year that he had on the defensive side of the football in BC is certainly going to be up there. And um, it will be interesting to see if Brady Oliveira, after winning maybe the toughest spot, just the bomber nomination, will be the guy for the big award. Great Cup week in Hamilton. But the award that they're looking at is a team one, and that is the one that goes to the winners of the Grey Cup. And that is the single and solitary goal of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers right now. Shout out to Not Auto Corp for that. Why not question of the day? Let's get to the cool bet lines. And as we mentioned, very slow night tonight after 16 games. We got one. The Washington Capitals and the New Jersey Devils. Caps plus 195 money line underdogs. The Devils minus 234 at home. Devils plus 105 on the puck line. Um, Remo, did you catch Ovi last night? 14 shots on goal, including, I believe, 12 in the first period. Yeah, well, he had got off to a slow start, so he was trying to slam... Uh, the puck in the net. Man, that Devils minus 105 does feel pretty good because they are absolutely uh, on fire. But uh, I saw Greg Wyshynski on, he was on with Jeff Merrick today, saying the Capitals exist now not to win games, but to get Ovechkin the record. They're still try- trying to hang on uh, to this group that they've had for so long. And uh, Ovechkin, yeah, he's on it. I mean, we'll see if he gets it or not, but it's something to watch in terms of uh, chasing history. Yeah, if you're looking for something to put a little sprinkle on tonight, uh, I like the Jack Hughes goal props. Uh, we were talking about this on the lock shop today. Plus 110 for Jack Hughes to score. Plus 490 for two. But I think my favorite, like coming off of last night, we know what Ovi's doing right now. He's, you know, shooting from the dressing room right now. Everything at the net. How can we not jump on over three and a half shots on goal tonight for Alex Ovechkin? That sounds, sounds very low. And Jack Hughes, listen to the season he's having so far, Hus. Played five games, 14 points. Oh, man, and oh, how tall is he? 5'11". I thought you couldn't score points in the NHL if you're under six feet, Huss. So uh, he's an incredible player, superstar, and part of the reason why uh, the Devils were a lot of people's preseason pick in the East, and they've got three solid lines. I think that, I don't know, that minus one and a half seems, that plus 105 seems like a decent bet to me, Huss. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll look at that. Now, we do have NBA action tonight. Uh, the Raptors are kicking things off at home against the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, the Raptors are one-point underdogs 
uh, minus 112, plus one. Yeah, and that's the move. If you just want to bet the Raptors to win, it's minus 111. You can get the point for basically the same number over at Cool Bet. So if you do want the Raptors, take the plus one at minus 112. I'm going to throw on a little uh, uh, Canadian content as well. Our guy, Shea Gilgis Alexander in the OKC Thunder. They're in Chicago to take on the Bulls. So uh, that's going to be my play today. Raptors plus one and the OKC Thunder to win. Um, before we finish up, though, we touched on this briefly at the beginning of the program, Remo. The dogs were barking in the ALCS and the NLCS. Game seven wins on the road. Well, and game six wins on the road. Texas and the Diamondbacks, the Rangers, are the favorites in game number one. And the Rangers are favorites in the series. Minus 169 for Texas, plus 147 for the D-backs. I saw J.D. Bunkus joke that uh, who says Ross Atkins can't build a World Series winner? Um, of course, that's a shot at the Gabriel Marino and Lourdes Goriel trade for Dalton Varsho. Um, but, you know, you've paid a lot of attention to baseball all year long. I don't know how many people will be paying attention to this series considering the teams that are in it. But what are your thoughts on uh, the odds and the eventual winner of the fall classic. Yeah, I would lean towards the Rangers, much better team in the regular season. And I mean, you're kind of stunned at the Phillies losing. They had chances with runners on in a couple innings and they're big hitters. The guys making the big money like Bryce Harper and Trey Turner did not come through. And you look at their stats, aside from that one game, they were totally shut down. And some of these D-backs are like, who are these guys? But they do have a very... Strong lineup, as you mentioned, Lourdes, uh, Guriel, and Gabriel Moreno, former Blue Jays, certainly a part of that. So I still would lean Rangers, although maybe they're pitching a bit questionable. But uh, two, I don't know. I don't think anyone thought it would be these teams. I was on Phillies for sure. You thought the Astros would be back first year since, I think, 2016. It doesn't have the Dodgers or the Astros in the World Series. So. And it, what Arizona won in 2001, the World Series, and Texas, they've never won. And they've had still, you know, that heartbreak losing in that, you know, legendary game to St. Louis. I think it was 2011, 2012, the game oh, six. Oh, the David Freeze the, game. The David Freeze game. Um, <laughs> you know, in, incredible, incredible game. And they still haven't recovered in Texas. So it's kind of nice to see uh, see them back in there. All right, now, shout out to everybody in chat. Um, oh, nice. 194 likes. We just need mm -hmm. six more, guys. Somebody throw those thumbs Here. up if you haven't already. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, it's Jamison Sheen. That's right. Thank you, One Bird, for uh, the pronunciation. And shout out to Isha Boy Bruce. I don't know where this came from, but I'm here for a too short reference. Anytime in the WST chat, you're exactly right. Blow the whistle. All-time banger from Oak Town's too short um what's uh what's on the what's mm -hmm. on the plate tonight you're gonna watch a little hoops um no baseball tonight there's a there's you know, a hockey one hockey game well here i'll give a shout out to everyone in chat if you missed it we didn't touch on this and podcast listeners too check out our youtube channel if you want more on last night's jets game myself and uh, connor connor rabchak did a nice little post game just 20 minutes on the game and i know something weird happened with my hair last game it looked away that it's never looked before uh someone commented to me is that remo's dad uh, with connor there i don't know maybe because he's a lot younger than me or just my hair something happened to it my wife's like you look like you're in like the 1950s or something <laughs> with that the part was all all wrong so if you want to go and laugh and laugh at that or enjoy that check our youtube channel what am i going to get up to channel might catch on uh catch up on some tv i enjoy the show uh, big mouth came out on netflix uh, the newest season on Friday, a nice animated, uh, raunchy comedy about coming of age. Uh, so I do enjoy that. And yeah, maybe I'll, what is this? Capitals, Devils, eh, NBA. Maybe I did have my basketball draft Monday. I'm also, I am psyched for NBA. But yeah, but maybe oh. a bit of a night off. Huh? So it was a late one for me yesterday, doing the video with Connor, uh, posting it, and then getting to bed. There was this, you know, 745 start means that, you know, the game starts later, but also ends it, later. Yeah, a great job by you guys. And folks, make sure if you did miss it, um, pop on over, give it a view, check it out, leave a uh, leave your thoughts in the comments. 
Um, and actually, I do have to say a, a hilarious story about last night, speaking of our pal Connor. So uh, I'm sitting in the uh, in 206 um, last night at the game, and there were a couple girls behind me that were probably, I don't know, like 20, 21, something like that, and uh, great fans. They were totally into the game. And at one point, one of them mentions they start talking about Connor and they said, you know, Connor Rabjack, he's like our age and he's just followed his passion and he's doing so well. And I, I didn't say anything, but I'm like, you know, that is cool. That is really, really cool. Um, you know, all the work that he's doing with the hockey writers and uh, coming on board with us. Um, and I guess we should plug Remo. Speaking of Connor, it's great to see people that are noticing that they're going to have a chance to um, see something that we're starting coming up this weekend, heading into Monday morning. Um, some new content when it comes to the Winnipeg Jets um, that Connor's going to be a big part of on our channel starting on the weekend. Yeah, stay tuned. We're going to put this together. I think it's going to be really good Sunday, Sunday night, maybe Monday morning. Uh, Connor will come out with a Jets this week, recapping the week in Jets news, getting set for next week. Won't be too long, and we'll put it out on the podcast as well. You know, 15, 20 minutes, get you set for... Uh, for Monday morning, so you know, make sure you know, link. All the links are in the description. Make sure you subscribe when you can know when it comes out. Hit the notification bell so you know when it comes out. And also, we're trying to do uh, get a news newsletter going. So uh, that's in great the description comments too. on the newsletter. By the way, I meant to yes. bring that up on Monday. I mean, my dad. I had a couple of ones. Hey, that was really great. Just let people know about that. What's sure. in it and how they can make sure that they've signed up for it. Sure, WinnipegSportsTalk.com. You can scroll down to the bottom or. There is a link in the description of this video, and I don't know once a week we'll say like, "Hey, what's going on?" and um, you know, let you know you know what you missed on the show. So, but last week, last week was a big one for Winnipeg Sports Talk. We had the night out at the Jets game, which was awesome. Gary joined in person, which was good, and you had that great video us talking about uh, attendance, uh, which was. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a shock you know, on that Tuesday game. You know, yeah. last night there were a couple seats short as well, but I think you were more you And the game was actually a good game. I think part of it was on that Tuesday game, like Velarde got injured as well. Oh, my God. It was, it was just, just a bummer. Like, thank God Dubois. we were there with our Winnipeg Sports yeah. Talk friends. It wasn't a great way to kick off our four-game pack, um, but I felt a lot better uh, being there with such great support from so many WSTers mm -hmm. and the fun we had before the game because – I mean, yeah, I mean, the holes in the crowd were concerning. That was the first time we've sort of seen where things are at this year. Mm -hmm. and as we've mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done to get this team back to where it needs to be. And that's going to be a conversation that continues over the next number of weeks. Um, I think you're a little bit more prepared. I mean, it's not as shocking if you've seen it a couple times. And I think early on in the season, especially on some of these early weekday games, that is going to be something that we have to. I, I, I will be interested to see about Monday's game, though. Because, um, and listen, it was Dubois' return. I know there's a lot of people fired up just to boo the hell out of the guy that weren't there on, on last Tuesday. Um, but, you know, the Rangers coming in, an original six team that always has somewhat of a draw. And obviously, I mean, Blake Wheeler, um, you know, was such a massive part of this organization since 2011. His return, I think, is significant. But I think it'll also be a really fun game, Remo, as, uh, you know, they finally have a legit Halloween game the day before Halloween. So, uh, listen, I I'm not sure whether that's going to make a huge difference in what the crowd is at for a Monday game. But I'll tell you what, the people in the building, I think, are going to be having a good time, both welcoming Blake back and uh, putting on their costumes a day early for what should be a, a, a pretty fun evening. Yeah, I think any time an original six team comes into Winnipeg, you know, Bruins, Red Wings, I'm, I'm talking about the American ones because we know the Canadian ones as well, but the American ones, Flyers, not original six, but I mean, they've been around for a long time and have a lot of Winnipeg fans, so Rangers would fall into that category, so I do think Ranger fans come out, they're certainly a draw, and yeah, Monday night, pre-Halloween, telling people to get in costumes, I have been at Halloween, you know, around that date games, and people do come uh, fired up, so... Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, seeing what happens uh, what happens there, Huss. And yeah, I, I'm expecting a big tribute uh, for Blake Wheeler as well there on Monday. I mean, franchise leader in in many categories, spent many years here, was a captain. Uh, you know, was part of the, some of the biggest moments as well. So I would expect a big tribute and big reception. Yeah, no doubt about that. Spencey and Chad, how long before Connor gets scooped up by the Steve Dangle? Are you kidding me? 
He's so young. He's not even a UFA. RFA <laughs> for WST. And we're, uh, we'll, we'll be making sure he doesn't need to go to greener pastures. But, yes, coming up on Sunday, um, pay attention. Or, you know, just for Monday morning, check out the uh, the Jets this week. are really looking forward to launching. We've done a really kind of dry run a couple weeks ago, and it was phenomenal. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting that out from uh, a talented young member of the crew in Connor Hrabchuk. Um, That's going to do it for us, gang. Great show today. Thanks to Craig Button. Oh, did he bring it? That was an awesome segment. Murata Tesh, as always, and Nick Dembski. Let's go. Blue and gold for the W. One more game at home, November 11th, and then uh, hopefully we'll see those Bombers again competing for the Grey Cup in Hamilton. Big thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. And most of all, all of you, whether on YouTube or on the podcast, for making us a part of yours. Game day edition tomorrow, Jets and Red Wings. We'll get all over it beginning at 1 p.m. live on YouTube and in your podcast feed right around 3.30 for your drive home. Have a great night, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow for a Jets Wings preview and the latest on Winnipeg sports here on WST. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com. 